Hello, Mover. Hello, Goggy. <laughs> Why are you staring at me like that? <laughs> it's the AI. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hope you don't disappear again. Uh, okay, I'm fixed. <laughs> we're back. We're having. We're gonna have. I, I, I'm just super paranoid now about technological should be issues. Or <laughs> yeah, if, if you leave things. tonight, that I mean, Gonky's on his own. No, I'm he's gonna talk to himself. No, it's gonna be the the Mover and Doug show. <laughs> Mover and Doug. Yeah, but I don't exist. So. Uh huh. Uh huh. You like uh, the Tool Man Taylor's neighbor? You know. That's you just, it. Hey. <laughs> uh yeah. Hey, we got a show today, I hope. Do we? Some actual <laughs> intel to provide. Yeah. Well, wait, 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 how was your week? Oh, we got to talk about all that stuff first. I'm just asking the probably the people's want to know. Yeah. Um did it ever end? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I we're mean, just, that's why like, we're a little I feel, right now. Yeah. <laughs> I look tired because I am. Um, about you, man. You did a secretary's well, yeah, job. Pretty... You were the secretary this weekend, <laughs> answering the phones. I was the highest paid secretary probably in the United States this weekend. Um, and I didn't do a very good job, to be honest, because yeah. I'm no. not a trained secretary. You did a great job, Gonky. Don't no, let was... him ever tell you. Um, don't let him ever tell you you didn't do a good job. because It was good. Mover and I had to say... Uh, uh, we had to say goodbye to a really awesome leader and they're, they're uh, few and far in between. So it was it the was, best, uh, yeah, the absolute was, best. Yeah. Bittersweet. I mean, I, you know, it's still a great place and he helped us get there and everybody moves on, but um, you know, it is what it is, but, uh, but yeah, overall it's a pretty, pretty awesome week slash weekend. And yeah. here we go into the next one, man. <laughs> Dude. Uh, yeah. So anyway, we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, the first topic is the Hoppajet update from the crash at Naples. And I thought this was just going to be, uh, Intel on the law enforcement side, because I actually got some stuff that I want to talk about, but then good the Intel. Re then, yeah, well then the NTSB released their preliminary report and it's not, um, so here's what happened. Uh, so the NTSB released a report earlier, uh, from the crash. The aircraft was going from Ohio State University Airport in Columbus. You know where that is? That's where, yeah, where you were, where your neck of the woods, right? I mean, yeah, it's Columbus, Ohio. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so it's a Bombardier CL 600 operated by Ace Aviation Services doing business as Hoppajet. Uh, they were returning to Florida. They were serviced with 350 gallons of fuel. And I know a lot of the initial speculation talked about, uh, was it Prist, where they had, whether they had done icing, de-icing, all that stuff in the fuel. But um, they don't talk about that here. But they do say uh, they used the ADS-B track. It was six and a half miles north. And we're going to watch. I want to watch the uh, dual engine failure thing again because it, I'd like to um, sync up the comms here in a second. So once I finish reading this, we'll go through the comms. But they were 166 knots, and they cleared them to land on runway 23. They turned their base leg, uh, which put them on a five-mile final. And then they got the F, the flight data recorders, and the flight data recorder said that uh, about a minute and a half later, they got three master warnings recorded flagging a problem with oil pressure in the left engine. This was immediately followed by an oil warning from the right engine. Then the system alerted pilots to illumination of a master warning light on the glare shield, a corresponding red message on the crew alerting system page, and a triple chime voice advisory engine oil. At 310, when the aircraft was approximately 1,000 feet MSL and slowed to 122 knots, the crew declared an emergency, notified ATC that it lost both engines. The aircraft was on a shallow intercept angle for final approach. ATC acknowledged the call, clearing the jet to land. Crew replied it was not going to make the runway. Uh, it was at an altitude of 900 feet and a ground speed of 115 knots. The uh, ADSB showed them on I-75 in Naples. Uh, it was rush hour. Oh, wow. Rush wow. hour on Friday. Wow. A lot of cars. Dash cam uh, submitted to the NTSB shows the final seconds. The left main touchdown, and then uh, in the center of the three lanes, and right main touchdown in the right lane, the jet rolled through the breakaway barrier into the grass shoulder area before impacting concrete barrier. I know a lot of people said it had hit a car. It doesn't say that here, but that doesn't mean it didn't. Um, 
So, uh, and then obviously they, they caught uh, a large, I mean, it caught fire at that point. Flight crew included the captain, FO, and the cabin attendant. And we didn't talk about the cabin attendant. I didn't even know right. of the cabin attendant, I think, when we first talked about this. But she did an amazing job. She saved those lives. Yeah. I mean, by far, she, I mean, just amazing. Yeah. Uh, so basically, she realized the cabin and emergency exits were blocked by fire. So she directed the passengers to the tail section of the airplane, and they evacuated through the baggage compartment door. Cabin attendant, the two passengers on board, and a motor sustained minor injuries. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, pilot and uh, first officer, the captain and first officer, did not survive. They were experienced 10,000 hours of flight time uh, and 2,000 in the accident airplane for the captain. And the um, FO had 24,618 hours of experience, 138 in the accident airplane. Wow. Uh, so the... Uh, its most recent continuous airworthiness inspection on the engines was January 5th at 9,763 hours of operation. Or sorry, that's the airplane. It's powered by two GE CF-34 uh, engines. Um, most of the aircraft was consumed by fire. It smelled of Jet A fuel and the ground was soaked with it. I know a lot of people also speculated about running out of fuel. Right. Uh, the center cockpit, uh, co the cockpit center console was separated was found separated from the main wreckage. Both the engine throttle levers were found near the idle stop position, which of course is consistent with you trying to land and stop. Flap selector was found in the position consistent with a 45 degree flap extension. Again, you, I mean, you're Normal. landing, you're configured. You're not going to deconfigure at 900 feet. You're just going to take what you got. Left wing was entirely uh, consumed by post-impact fire. Evidence of right wing had impacted the vertical steel I-beam of a highway sign. The outer portion of the wing had been torn off. Right wing fuel boost pump was located. The left wing fuel boost pump was not. Tail section was largely intact, damaged. They noted the engines were still attached and approximately 16 ounces of liquid with an odor and appearance consisted with jet A fuel was drained from the aft tail fuel tank. Sample contained about a half ounce of what appeared to be water. That's not a lot. I mean, that's not a lot of water. No. Um, APU unit fuel filter bowl was removed for visual inspection of the fuel and filter. No debris was noted in the drain fuel and the filter appeared clean. Uh, fuel was retained for analysis. Engines were also removed for further examination. They did not find any structural anomalies on the right engine. Uh, and examination of the left engine, oil filter in good condition, no particles were observed in the pleats. Uh, fuel samples were collected from various points throughout the system. It was noted the fuel from the fuel filter and heat exchanger displayed a yellowish tint while the other fuel samples were clear. The odor of the samples was consistent with Jet A. In addition, the main fuel inlet port exhibited a small yellow colored debris particle. The oil filter appeared in good condition, no particles. So it's interesting, right? You get um, oil indications is the first thing you get. Yeah, it. I mean, I, it didn't say like what kind of oil, right? I mean, if it's like low oil pressure, that's both engines shutting down, right? If it's high temperature, that could be an issue. I, I, I guess where I'm going with this, it's extremely, extremely rare for modern airplanes to lose both engines. Both engines, right? Both. right. That's why initially everybody thinks, well, it's a fuel problem, right? Because right. But you the think fire on the ex when it landed, the explosion, that's that's fuel, right? But uh, so what's the yellowish tent? Like, what are they like? They got a little bit of water, but what's the other stuff? Is it the, you know, what was it some issue with, with icing or well, contamination of the fuel? Some of the, you know, some of the people in the chat and they may be onto something we're speculating now, but if you remember the British air triple seven, that <clears throat> basically uh, the engines didn't flame out. I just don't think they responded and they ended up crashing it just short of the runway. Uh, what, the deal there was was in the, within the fuel filters the fuel had like partially frozen or gelled in the filters because of the extreme out they were at high altitude for yeah. a while yeah and uh some people are speculating maybe it was something along those lines but i i'm with you mover it's very mo you know modern uh jet airplanes with two engines it's i mean it's it's extreme yeah, it's now granted it's happened and the A320 like twice because of the fade egg. <laughs> I don't like birds, but um, there's no birds in this one. Maybe. I mean, they, well, haven't, they haven't found any, you know, they haven't. This is preliminary. So at this point, yeah. 
-hmm. other thing I think people had speculated was when the captain he you know he goes to get the flaps he might have hit the the cutoff. I don't. I mean, based on maybe you know, would your first indication for an engine shutdown be an engine oil warning? I don't know about that aircraft. It doesn't sound consistent with that, but that's again. I mean, that's why we wait until they finish their report. But so it's some interesting stuff we found out, and I want to draw attention. And I talked about this last time. I want to draw attention to the uh, Shadow Five. That was the helicopter that happened to be in the area that did some on-scene stuff. And uh, I got an email or a message from one of the pilots that was there that day. And um, we don't usually, you know, you never really think about the rescue folks that show up and try to help. But I want to play the audio real quick and then I want to read uh, what he said to me and just kind of give credit to what they did because, I mean... Uh, they still were, were right there and, and doing a good job. So here's the audio one more time. Uh, we've played this last time. Okay, uh, Challenger, uh, Hoppajet A223, lost both engines, emergency. I'm making an emergency landing. Whatever. Got that emergency, clear to land runway 23. Is that Hoppajet A23? Uh, we're clear to land, but we're not going to make the runway. Uh, we've lost both engines. Five seventy four to hold short. Tower Shadow Five, where's that? Shadow Five, there are two northwest right over I seventy five. Hop a jet eight twenty three. Uh... Everybody stand by. There's an alert three in progress. Everybody stand by. Tower Shadow Five rescue helicopter request to go to the scene. Shadow Five, proceed direct as requested. Okay, so. That's the part I wanted to talk about. Let's remove this real quick and fix that. I got the uh, audio echoing here. <clears throat> Did you make it? <laughs> Do what? I can't tell if you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, so I wanted to read this. So uh, the crew of Shadow 5, the Collier County Sheriff's Office, they were getting ready to do SAR search and rescue hoist training. Uh, we had just started. So they were sitting on the pad at Naples with a full crew, uh, Sheriff's Pilot, Sheriff Co-Pilot, Sheriff Crew Chief, and two North Collier Fire Department Firefighters Paramedics. So you already have some highly trained people uh, in the area. He said he heard him make the initial call. He had the crew get in and they went to work. 90 second flight to the scene. And you heard that just now where, you know, he's listening. They're on the ground, sitting there waiting. And he goes, hey, where is he? You know, because he knew things were going to get bad. He said he immediately recognized it was not going to be a hoist. Quarter mile debris field with heavy fire. Traffic still flowing both directions. Remember, it's rush hour traffic. Uh, around the crash site in the southbound lanes. Landed in the northbound lanes, dropped off the medics to start triage. Our medics were on scene for several minutes by themselves, gathering as much information as possible for the other responding fire departments and, and EMS. As soon as those guys were off, were out, he took back off with his co-pilot is handling the scene for law enforcement. So remember, he's flying, and in the other seat, uh, they're actually talking on police radios, like we talked about with Daniel. Advising where it was uh, and what needs to happen, such as shutting down on and off ramps, painting the big picture for responding units to prepare for a mass casualty incident, eventually the on-scene ground commander, and secure the scene. Once we gave as much info as possible and other uh, firefighting departments arrived, I landed the helicopter in the southbound lane south of the crash, far right lane, to leave access for responding units. My thought process was that we normally take crashes that happen off airport property within the county at this point was of little value in the air. So I divided myself, my co-pilot, crew chief to check vehicles involved, get names, plates, all the info we could for the report. Eventually, we were told Florida Highway Patrol will handle the report. They were relieved that we had already gathered a majority of the information needed for them. Flight attendant and passengers got out as we were dropping off medics. I assumed they were good Sam's checking the airplane. We later found out they were the passengers. 
Talking about working under pressure, two pilots did the best they could to minimize the impact on others, but the flight attendant surviving the crash and having the ability to get her packs out of the cargo door with literally seconds left before the fire consumed the fuselage needs to be celebrated 10 to 15 seconds longer and they wouldn't have made it. Somber day, but as you know, we get paid to do a very specific uh, job helping others. It's easy to get sucked into the moment and vapor lock on certain things, but crew resource management and talking to each other can help break that chain of bad decisions to get the best outcome possible. Um, as far as scene management for the entirety, the agencies down there handled it very well. So uh, when I got that message, you know, and sent chills up, you know, because we we That's talked it crazy. We talked about this, and you know, it's it's that whole be ready. Cause you don't know when the call is going to come. You don't know when it's going to happen and it's going to be your time to do, do the work. Now, unfortunately they weren't able to save the pilots, but they were right there to help the, the passengers who had luckily gotten out. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, you just never know, right? That's why, that's why in any, you know, in the military or in law enforcement rescue or anything like that, you know, that's the, the whole mantra of, you know, you, you train like you fight cause you never know. Yeah. Uh, it's very rare that, you know, uh, something planned comes along and you're, you know, you're able to execute. It's usually just, you know, uh, a surprise like it was for you. But, but, you know, if you're trained and ready, it, it, it you know, you mm -hmm. read, read through that. It almost sounds like, it, you know, he wasn't surprised. He just knew what to do. Right. Not only was he not surprised, but he had the situational awareness. Cause you know, sometimes the, the risk is always, you're sitting on the ramp, you kind of dropped your pack, you're waiting for everybody to load up, you're not really interested. And he was listening, you know, he was listening on the radio, got got the information needed, immediately keyed up when it was appropriate, you know, not jamming up the frequency, but immediately keyed up like, hey, send me in, I'm ready. And um, I'm sure it, 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 it helped the situation, especially being able to coordinate all the other units coordinate the shutdown of the interstates, getting on and off ramp shut down. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it that people don't realize logistically. And the fact that, you know, we're only talking about unfortunate, you know, it's unfortunate we lost two lives, but good Lord, a uh, rush hour on a Friday could have been so much. Yeah. Worse. I mean, you know, like we, you know, in the fighter world, we'd always brief like, you know, uh, first person to the scenes, the on-scene commander. But, you know, in this case, you know, dealing with rush hour traffic. Oh, yeah. An airplane, you know, crashing just past the uh, the field, but obviously the field, you know, the tower knew what what had happened. I mean, there's a lot of really non-standard dynamic stuff going on there, and they, man, they really, <laughs> yeah. I mean, kudos, man. That's that's outstanding. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, moving on from that, uh, we've got one. Actually, we're going to save this one for uh, your later topic. We have some relevant uh, chats. Jason says left wing hit top of a pickup truck, crushed the cab, but minor injury there. Uh, I'm people in Naples and really appreciate your show. So awesome. Thanks, man. So they did hit one of the vehicles. I remember that, but I think what caused, it sounds like what caused it to actually spin around was hitting like structural stuff from the interstate. So I don't think a truck yeah. would be enough to I'll do something that massive. Rush hour, I, you're, you're trying to land a jet and rush hour traffic, you're going to hit something. <laughs> yeah. You know, luckily minor injuries. I mean, that right. would have been fatal. Right. And uh, Justin says the first master caution that appears in a challenger when engine shut down is oil pressure. So, I mean, maybe I mean, engine just I rolling mean, back. Maybe it goes back to that other theory of the inadvertent shutdown. I don't know. I That's what investigators are going to figure out. Uh, obviously, there's enough time to put them back and hope that they spool up. So they wouldn't still be in that position. Maybe. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, you're right. You, you don't know. So, okay. Um, moving on from uh, that one. Um, the Su-57, which is a very popular topic, fifth gen, not a chance. Fifth gen. Um, not the cars, but the Su-57 <laughs> has been used. Uh, Russia uses the newest Su-57 jet to strike targets in Ukraine. And they've talked about that before. Like, it's not, this is not a new thing. They've talked about it a few times that Russia is using the new Su-57. But this is the first time where I've seen them talk about uh, a specific date and specific targets. And what they said was they reportedly used their latest Su-57 uh, fighter jets in recent combat operations targeting Ukrainian military positions. 
And on February 18th, they were escorted by two Su-35s. Uh, the Su-57 launched a missile strike on Ukrainian targets, utilized advanced KH-69 stealthy cruise missile specifically designed for the Su-57. Operating from occupied territory, the Su-57 entered the Ukrainian airspace and es under escort launched a missile. Uh, due to a technical malfunction, the missile missed. Crashed no field. And why? <laughs> Uh, it was developed by Sukhoi. It's Russian fifth gen. It made its maiden flight. So that's a picture of the KH-69. Hmm. Um, failed to reach its targets. Pre previous reports indicate involvement in airstrikes on the February 7th and 8th uh, for the missile itself. So it's uh, deployed on various combat aircraft. Additionally, it's been noted Russia utilized the newest Su-57 missile attack in Russia to make a military propaganda film. Uh, this film is expected to showcase evidence of successful. So that last peace is telling right the question of why do you need fourth gen fighters to escort your fifth gen fighter into ukrainian territory um somebody who had the gopro out in the back seat for their propaganda film and then and then it missed so they're gonna have to fix it in post um yeah <laughs> yeah but i mean <laughs> think anyone got in trouble for taking that video mover no it's on purpose they were told <laughs> This joke. Uh, Inside Putin, joke. Putin directed <laughs> them to take it, and they're probably going to get their pictures in the whatever the Russian Pentagon is. I'll be in the wall. <laughs> in the yeah, yeah, yeah. When, pretty wild, when, man. When Putin um, approves, you end up in the Russian Pentagon. Um, I don't know, man. Maybe they do. I mean, it's not uncommon to do uh, mixed fourth and fifth gen strikes. Yeah, into into Ukrainian territory though. I'm just um, saying, like operating uh, in the West. I mean, we do it. Yeah, I don't know what their we, tactics are, but we do. Um, I don't know. I mean, to me, if you're just if if you're trying to showcase the the fifth gen stealth capabilities, you're showcasing it, saying we sent one, you didn't know about it, and it struck its target. We sent three, you knew about it, and it missed. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. Playing devil's advocate though, uh you're <laughs> if you send a couple uh <clears throat> non-stealth airplanes with your stealth plane, your strike package is not gonna be stealthy. I mean, <laughs> newsflash, right? Correct. <laughs> so. That is that is information that they need to know. <laughs> um I don't want to reveal too many secrets, but that is <laughs> that's that, a true statement. Would be true. Yeah, no, we, I yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 man, I agree with you 100%. It's, it is kind of weird. You know, the, the ultimate would be like, hey, you know, last week that thing that blew up, yeah, you didn't see, you didn't see that coming, did you? And then just well, not say anything. <laughs> you, Gonk, you actually make a good point. So, um, you know, we're joking about it's not stealthy, but if you're trying to hide the radar cross section of an aircraft, you put it with a mixed section. So now you're not divulging what it is and what they have. And so you're just using this new missile that's designed to be carried on this thing in kind of a real world operational test. It failed. So I don't know why we would report this on the news, but you know, it's twofold, right? Cause you're, you're not giving them now granted military intelligence is smarter than that. They can figure out who's who and what's what in that, in that section or division. Um, but that could be the logic, right? You're not trying to advertise what the how stealthy this thing is by putting it right. with non-stealthy aircraft. And there was is a Su-35. I mean, not stealthy. It, not stealthy, but <laughs> um, it's like they don't, they don't have any two-seaters, do they? Are there any two-seat Su-35s or no? Oh, dude, I get it mixed up. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's the advanced you, flanker. You may or may not have a dude filming because if you're because the bottom set it was a propaganda film, right? So. Obviously, you need somebody to film this thing. Well, the flanker off. has an autopilot. I mean, I you could you could do it from a single seat. It's dangerous, Gonky. Well, <laughs> Russians are all about safety. Uh, you, know. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as the weapon missing, I mean, <clears throat> you know, even stateside, oh, yeah. it's it's a big deal. So this, what they shot was a precision weapon, right? So in the U.S., I know, man, it's a big deal when a precision weapon misses, and it's. That's why I mean, Mover can back me up on this. Like, 
Uh, Never. I'm not going to back you up on anything. <laughs> on your own. A, uh, a smart <laughs> weapon requires all kinds of validation and whatnot that's recorded uh, before yeah. you even employ it. Because if it does uh, miss its target, they want to know why. And it's just to make it better. And, you know, it happens with Western weapons. Um, you know, I've had a couple not do what they're supposed to do. And you submit all the data. And, you know, what you're on the hook for is recording uh, everything well, you needed to record and then they you know hopefully they they fix it and that's the thing this is real world operational test right that's these these theaters the the houthi conflict the israeli conflict like we're everybody in the americans the russians the chinese everybody's getting real world test data whether they're observing whether they're acting or whether you know they're a, a third party supplying weapons there's there's so much data being gained including tactics I mean, look at the prol proliferation of drones now and look at the new tactics involving that and, and tank warfare and everything is being it's it, it's like a, I mean, it's a test pilot's dream, an operational test pilot's dream because they they get real world results like you talked about. And oh, by the way, you get you might have gotten a tactical objective if it had hit a target. <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't want next time. No, we don't want next time. That's right. We don't want no, next time. Right. Yeah, we don't want next time. But it is interesting, um, though. They're using the uh, that airplane. And uh, to be honest, I I didn't really. I thought of it more as an air to air. I didn't really think they would. Use that's because you watch Top Gun Maverick. Is it? So is it like that? Maybe that's like when we sent the Raptors to go do some air to ground stuff just to justify it. We're like, hey, I mean, uh, it, let's put some little bombs right. on there just to. I mean, it can, but that does that mean it should? I don't know. Do you, do you think felon pilots are not a pound for air to ground people? And they're like, oh, it missed. Good. Dude, they're 100 percent. I guarantee they're 100 percent like super Dog eagle fighters. guys. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're Zamboni the drivers equivalent. Like you've yeah. never seen. <laughs> they, they did a BFM set after and they debrief that longer than the miss. Correct. <laughs> Correct, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on uh well let's see first before we do that i gotta make sure we don't have any uh i think we got one uh all right here we go joe says hi guys gonky that was my thought too stealth with non-stealth equals not a stealthy package um I love your patch man yeah we love your wolf <laughs> uh hey sorry about my previous comments i have watched piles of your content's really good i'm not sure what that is thanks jeff to, you appreciate the support, guys man. we're cool but going back to this one you know i mean that's right. There, that yeah. could be intentional. Like, yeah, we don't know we what their tactics know. are. I mean, it could have right. been purely yeah. a publicity stunt. It could have been uh, part of their tactics to keep the felon, you know, from getting well, shot. Well, I don't know. Well, because there's, well, it could be a, a a mode four or an IFF thing right. to keep them from shooting themselves down. Because if or you that. believe the Russians, they have a habit of shooting themselves down. Or <laughs> if you go with the other side, they're getting shot down a lot like 14 in the last 10 days kind of a lot so they're yeah, not if you're, <laughs> if you're a russian pilot you're like well going into the country bad coming back home could also be bad. also be bad <laughs> yeah like, I don't, which one do i want to believe they're both uh, terrible yeah, but be, i'm at the get well altitude everybody <laughs> the gear is down that's the defector yeah. profile it doesn't matter i'm <laughs> yeah please don't shoot <laughs> but um oh, dude. i mean they don't so the because it's not an air to air, like you're you're not worried about that yeah. in that scenario with with a long range weapon because that's just the air picture is just not like that. I mean, right? Not yet. Maybe right. when the Vipers show up and the Mirage two thousands and all that stuff, but that's a, a way a little, little ways away. That's not there yet. So I don't know. It's interesting stuff. It Thanks is for interesting. The comments and. Uh, We'll move on to the next topic, uh, Gonky. You wanted to talk about the Finnish Hornets. This is just Hornet my things. little advertisement for the Ukraine. <laughs> uh, so uh, Finland has Hornets, um, and they operate them, I think the Swiss do too, off of roads. And this is just a really cool video of a Hornet doing a mill power takeoff on a road. I don't know if you stopped it, but uh, yeah, there he goes. Pretty cool um yeah i i mean mover you talk about you know the f-16 having the big uh inlet down there sucking in debris um we did that article about the ukrainians saying we don't want your australian f-18 junk and you know 
the Hornets, <laughs> I think, a little more robust airplane when it comes to being able to operate in and out of rough areas. And the Finns do it. And when I worked at Boeing, uh, a plug for Finland, the, when I was, we had this big meeting where all the uh, different countries that uh, bought the legacy Hornet came and we'd all talk about problems and stuff. And uh, the Finn guys were over and the Finnish guys were over in their table and, and the Boeing guys were like, oh, we sold them the plane, then we never hear from them. <laughs> like, yeah, because they, they, they don't have they don't any need us. Yeah, they're like, we, they don't need us. They never call. They're like our best customer. <laughs> so, well, um, do the wings even fold at all? Is that why they're nine G jets? I think the Swiss. I mean, I think the Swiss jet is the only one with the different one. I could be wrong. Oh, it could be okay. the Swiss and the Finn jet, but um, because I thought they yeah. had the demo. Don't they have a demo? They do, and uh, I met. Uh, one of the Finnish de demo pilots in Malaysia, he came there and he was, he was super cool. Cause he'd flown the MiG 21. Uh, that's, uh, a, that's a change. In, in Finland, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He'd flown all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, he told me he did the demo in the MiG 21. It lasted so like six minutes and he was out of gas crazy. But uh, yeah, the, <clears throat> the, the Finn maintainers and the, the, I can't remember the test pilot's call sign. I, don't, I can't even remember what he was doing in Malaysia, but uh, I spent like a whole afternoon talking with him. He was <laughs> uh, super smart. Awesome. But yeah, that's my, uh, that's my little plug for the Ukraine to, you know, really consider the F-18, man. You can take it off from your highways. You don't even need a runway. I don't know. What do you think, Mover? I think it's too late. They already said no. Where are they going to get Hornets? Who else? Is boneyard? Well, they got Boneyard, yeah. Marines. I'm sure the Marines, well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah you're right. Whatever. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. M says, what's the loudest jet you've ever heard? I think an F4. Prowler. <clears throat> oh, really? 100%. Really? Yeah. Dude, I, I was underneath the uh, GBD number two in my stateroom. And when the Prowler would go in attention, I mean, like, you know, you'd have your phone on the table and just <laughs> fall off. I mean, there's no your t literally, I don't have feelings, but the roots of my molars were rattling in my head. Yeah. It was terrible. Wow. I, let it go. Let it fly for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah. Prowler. All right. Moving on. Uh, so I, I didn't even know they were operating in this area. So an F five had a mishap at Hill and shut the base down or shut the runway down, uh, and did an emergency. Nope. This is not the right one. Uh, it's this one. So, the Hill Air Force Base closed the airfield after a plane makes an emergency landing. This was uh, Thursday afternoon, so last week. Officials report an F-5AT jet belonging to a private military con contractor, TAC Air, or Tactical Air Support, was headed to the base for training when the incident happened. An F-5 belonging to the Tactical Air Support, a private military contractor providing aggressor aircraft for the 388th Fighter Wing Training, performed a gear-up landing or belly landing at Hill Air Force Base after an in-flight emergency. Landing was uneventful, and the pilot is safe. He was the only occupant on board, and um, they had to do a runway inspection, but obviously uh, all was good after that. And so one of my viewers sent me a picture. I don't know where he got it from. I don't know the source. I just – this is the recovery. Airplane. That's a good-looking airplane. That's a really good-looking airplane. That's a, what is an F five AT? I don't know, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Attack Tiger. <laughs> I don't know. So, I mean, there's a lot of different scenarios, right? It could be, you know, any any gear problem. Sometimes it's better to land gear up, like that. We did the Viper, yeah, uh, a while back mm -hmm. where he got that uh, award. And you know, if you get a configuration that is not survivable especially with one nose gear one main gear or just the nose gear or something like that typically it's better to bring all the gear up land on the belly than try to risk it you don't really want one main because you'll just go off-roading and it's going to be bad i don't know that that's the case it could be that the gear wouldn't come down at all there's there's whole different scenarios but typically these types of landings are the most survivable for both the pilot and the jet, and it's a, I mean, it's a long runway. The only problem with Hill is higher elevation. Uh, it's like a couple, like 4,000 feet, 5,000, uh, four something. Yeah. You're, I mean, <clears throat> like you said, you really want to, 
and a pointy nose and that's a very pointy nose airplane you definitely want to keep that thing on the prepared surface if you're if you're landing and uh if you don't have like both mains down uh you know if you got the nose in one main Mm -hmm. it's gonna be super hard i mean the the 38 was similar right and that thing had really poor directional control <laughs> dude i'd yeah, rather well, belly land it i think it's the same setup right where you have to hold the nose wheel steering down if you know for yeah i think you're right you know yeah, it's not a it's not, on not. off or anything like that yeah but obviously the f5 people always ask what's the difference between f5 and t38 you know you've got the leading edge root extensions you got motors. the leading edge devices, bigger engines, single radar, seat guns, <laughs> radar missiles. Right. You know, you've got attach points for right. hard points for everything. Um, and I also want to point out this was a private military contractor. However, I can almost guarantee that this was an experienced military former or maybe even current reservist military pilot flying it. You know, yeah. so there, it's not just. Hey, Joe, Bob, you got your, uh, you know, you got your type rating in the F5. Come on down. We'll let you fly. These, these companies are providing professional adversary air as part of a contract to free up government assets to go do other stuff because right. We're in the, the continuing resolution. We don't have any money, all that stuff. They provide cheaper and it is cheaper overall because of, you know, you're not paying retirements and medical and all that stuff. They just say, here's your contract give us red air on these dates. And typically that's how it works out. So there are pros and cons. We can talk about that in another, another episode, but I, I just wanted to point out, cause, you know, people will ask why was there an F five, a civilian F five landing at Hill or providing red air. And that's just how the contracts work. Cause that came up when we talked about, uh, the Ukraine F 16s that Draken was going to get there. Like, well, why, yeah. why is a civilian company buying it? And that's why. I don't know what, I mean, I really like that paint job. I, I'm not a, usually a lot of, you know, ATAC and uh, all the civilian companies. They have, yeah, they look nice, but they don't have, that's a, the only problem with that paint job is, right, it stands out. <laughs> it's Tally 1, <laughs> right? Definitely the F5. <laughs> well, if I'm a blue air guy, I'm happy about that. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. I want if it I'm to be the, bright orange. What, hey, what is it? What does it say on the backbone? Tactical Peace. air. Is that what it says? Tactical air. Okay. Yeah. And then on the is that does that have a jam? Is it resting on a jammer pod or a blivet or something? No, I think they that's a um, inflatable thing they put in oh, okay. to lift it up to get the straps underneath. Okay. Like I don't I don't think it's resting on anything. The flaps maybe a little bit down, but uh, I don't think it's. I think that's like the inflatable thing they stick up under it to get it up so they could get the straps and then I I'm gotcha. guessing they'll either pick it up and put the gear down or. Put it on a truck. I would think they're going to put the gear down. Yeah. You know, if it can there. come down. Yeah. Is the dude still in it? No, I thought that too. It's a guy standing. Oh. See his legs. I know. I saw that. I was like, is that his helmet? <laughs> that's the stuff nightmares are made out of. <laughs> yeah, can you true. imagine, dude? You're like, hey, stay in here. We got to get the crane. <laughs> no, Four I'm hours getting... later. Like I'm popping that canopy. I'm there, out. No, no chance am I waiting for them to get two cranes and a recovery team. No, no flip, chance. Drop that thing on its back, and you'll be dead. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll pop every you know jettison the canopy, get the canopy breaker tool off the window, and start jabbing my way out. There's he has the same. You know it. Yeah. Oh yeah. You never played DCS? Remember DCS? It's the exact same. God. I'm just saying. If you, if you paid attention. Uh, some related comments. Zippers Forever says Advanced Tiger, aka HUD Hotas, oh, RWR wow. data link. Wow, that'd be fun to fly. That would be fun to fly. Rocky's wow. available. Uh, T Wolf Jaeger says F5 AT looks like TAC Air's homegrown designation for an F5 with upgraded uh, avionics and Erst. Wow, I did not see the Erst. Do you see an Erst on there? Might might be via pod, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, we're going to talk about Erst here in a second, actually, when we talk about the Rafal. Uh, but thank you. No, it's always good when they uh do that and then um all right so that's it for the relevant comments for uh that one the next topic on our list gonky you wanted to talk about the boeing yeah. refueling drone and whether drones. you would do that drones. how do you feel about that i did it a little bit um so to speak so <laughs> boeing <del> <laughs> so boeing delivers so boeing delivers the mq was it 25 for uh for yeah and and I'll point out, 
we've skipped this topic quite a few times because I originally picked this because Wombat was going to be on <laughs> and it had the E2 refueling off of it. So yeah, which is, I think is, a, is kind of a new capability for the E2 because it's, <clears throat> yeah, you know, so when you both, can fly for 10 hours, why not fly for 20 if you can refuel? They're both <laughs> learning. So we've got two sides <laughs> learning. We've got the AI learning and then Wombat's um uh, he's not here to he's not you cannot bully him right now he's not here not to bullying. defend himself this is not bullying gonky okay. you should you know what you need to learn how to recognize bullying so you can stop bullying people because right. this is not bullying let's this get bullying back into this deep intel all on right, the stingray all right, oh, all right. so <laughs> Mooch, I love you. Um, hey, so they deliver <laughs> they delivered this thing for testing, and honestly, it's a long time coming. I I flew, I caught the tail end of the S3, and the S3 originally was designed as a anti-submarine uh, platform, and then it just kind of as that mission, I don't know, kind of went to you know helos, P3s, whatever. Uh, they became the primary tanker, and the S3 was a fantastic tanker. It could actually carry gas to give you, um, and it wasn't loud and obnoxious. Then they, you know, th the Super Hornet came along and is going to replace everything, <clears throat> including the S3, and it was going to be a tanker. And I will tell you that the Super Hornet is by far the worst tanker I've ever tanked off of. Like, I'm not sure I could design a worse tanker. Uh, incredibly loud, and they can't give you much gas. Uh, while they're five wet, they're burning a ton of fuel because there's so much drag. So they're they're burning the gas was supposed to give. They can't give that much. It's it's not good. So I don't really like the idea of drones coming. But uh, if there's one mission I would give to a drone, it would be tanker, uh, especially around the ship. Because I mean, you could just launch this thing instead of a manned Super Hornet to do circles above the ship for you know the recovery or. <clears throat> Um, you know, just organic uh, tanking, you can launch this thing. So Stingray's got 15, 16,000 pounds of fuel. So, <clears throat> you know, I think no problem. It's going to be able to give maybe, you know, depending on how many airplanes uh, are in the launch or the recovery, you're going to be able to give at least 1,500 pounds of gas to probably four or five airplanes. Uh, whereas the Super Hornet, I used to, you know, by the time I join on him, it's like, Hey man, I, I, how much can you give me? We can give you 500 pounds. I'm like, it took me 500 pounds to get here. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I, man, I hope, you know, I hope the, uh, the testing goes well and I hope they're able to get it out there. I'm still really not convinced on the whole unmanned thing around the carrier because it's such a dynamic environment, but, um, I'm just an operator and there's people way smarter than me working on these things. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it pans out, but it, uh, the Navy definitely needs a better a better uh, carrier tanker. How much space does it take up on the ship? Probably not any more than I mean, it's similar size to yeah. you know an F eighteen. And you know, the other thing the article mentioned was, <clears throat> uh, you know, you're saving flight hours. You know, you, when you a lot of people maybe don't know it, but you know, the there are Super Hornets. The pylons are canned out, right? So you stick it's five wet, right? So you've got all yeah. these pylons out there that are sticking out like this. So, you know, it's, it's tremendous stress on the airframe. So by having an unmanned aerial tanker out there, you're saving flight hours on F 18s that could be used for tactical stuff. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but you know, the plan is to get super Hornet, you know, probably beyond 2040 and they ain't going to happen if you burn up all your flight hours. And while I was in, shocker uh when the super hornet was designed in the 90s we weren't you know blowing holes in the sand well we spent 20 years blowing holes in the sand which burned up a lot of the uh, yeah. flight hours yeah. in the super hornet so when the navy guys were doing their planning and they were doing long-range planning they're like well super hornet should get us all the way to here to whenever the you know f-35 i'm sure I, I don't know if they knew the f-35 was coming then or not but you know it <clears throat> it, it it really compressed the the timeline for them based on just burning flight hours and tanking in a fighter to me is just a horrible idea across the board Remember? tanking from a fighter you mean like tanking from the fighter and being the tanker <laughs> that's what i'm saying tank being the tanker as a fighter yeah it's it's a yeah. horrible waste of the fighter of the pilot um uh, 
And like I said, as a tanker, it's not very good. It doesn't give much gas, and it's incre incredibly loud. You, the the burner cans are like right here. Yeah, it's not something you think about. Yeah. No, you can't hear anything. You got the the radios turned up full blast. Your teeth are rattling. Yeah. It's uh, no bueno. How much gas did this thing say it would take? It carries fifteen or sixteen thousand pounds. Uh, I I don't imagine it burns a whole lot of fuel. They say it has a five hundred mile range, but to be honest, if you're if no. you're the recovery tanker, you're just doing circles over the ship. What's what's a normal offload for recovery? You're just taking a couple thousand pounds just to get <clears> you to. Uh, well, it depends on what the tanker can give. Anywhere from five hundred to fifteen hundred pounds is typically what you would get out of. Yeah, so you're not. You're not. I mean, so fifteen to sixteen thousand pounds will actually get you quite a few. Yeah, so, with decent give, like you know, you probably get yeah twenty five hundred pounds stuff like that now. You know, <clears throat> it depends on, you know, if you're, if you've just taken off and you just want to top off. So like if we were doing, mm. uh, like <clears throat> self escort strikes, so I would take off and I would go and I would top off. And, you know, if I took 1500 pounds, I would top me off. No problem. So I had full tanks, uh, to go, but you know, if you're coming back from like, you know, in my case, Afghanistan, Iraq, and you were getting low on gas, you know, you would take what you could get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Gonky. Um, Guardsmith says, uh, refueling question for mover. Did you do in-flight refuel with both the USN and Air Force? I did not. No, we never had tankers at 204. Never needed them. Yeah. Um, but so here's an interesting uh, chat from the audience. This was on your channel, Gonky, but it was for us, for me, for thanks, you. DG. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks, DG. But uh, it, it brings up a good point. Um, so mover, have you looked at DG says mover? Have you looked at bogey dope air national guard pilot jobs, IE F 15 slots with the one twenty second fighter squadron contact visit rush squadron, bell chase LA contact or, or uh, machine. And a lot of people don't know that this is how it works in the guard reserve. So I wanted to take a moment to actually pull up and this for sure guarantees there no there's no chance they're going to hire me now um <laughs> is this I'll, fresno I'll, no this is no, the 122nd oh, fighter squadron uh, they're the wing okay. the 122nd <laughs> fighter squadron is in new orleans that's right and that's right. so <clears throat> this is how hiring works in the guard reserve especially so you would go to a mill recruiter uh first millrecruiter.com and then you would go click on the link i've already done all this um previously just now and I wanted to read this. So, and so anybody who's actually interested, you know, if they're interested in, in applying, because this is both UPT for undergraduate pilot training. So if you're off the street, hint, hint, uh, or if you're rated like this old guys over here, you can apply. And so they say they're commonly known as the Bayou Militia, which that changed in the area of political correctness, because that's not how <laughs> it used to be. It's currently searching for potential current fighter pilots to join our rich heritage of Eagle drivers. As an Air National Guard unit located in New Orleans, Louisiana, we offer a multitude of activities outside of flying the world's greatest air superiority flight fighter, fishing, hunting, boating, NBA, and NFL games. Who dat? New Orleans Saints. Mardi Gras, we just had. Live music, crawfish boils, nightly trips to the French Quarter. Ooh, I don't know about all that. That's uh, dangerous. Are all just a few of the world-class activities at your disposal here in southern Louisiana? Well, they're, they got to talk it up, right? You're not going to say, hey, it's Fallujah. You know, you don't want to bring your bring your gun. And come on down. You know, nobody's going to say that. Um, but anyway, Conk, you're not laughing at my joke, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you should expect to work Tuesday to Friday, which is awesome, plus one weekend per month for drill, as well as sitting alert periodically throughout the month at the home station here in the Big Easy. During work days, you'll be tasked with flying the F-15C Eagle, pushing it to its limits in the air-to-air -air realm, which includes dogfighting conducting tactical intercepts, and defensive offensive counter-air missions. Additionally, you should expect an occasional TDY cross-country and or deployment. Disclaimer, mm -hmm. if you are searching for a place that li lives to drop 500-pound B-words and shoot the gun incessantly at the ground, this is not the spot for you. <laughs> no pound for air to ground. This sounds I love like it. something you cannot live without Then reach out and contact one of our Eagle Driver, POCs, uh, Rated Applicants, UPT. I love it. First of all, I love it because creativity, <laughs> I mean, it sells, right? Yeah. That sells. <clears throat> uh, as a F-16 pilot, there's some stuff I could say about making fun of that, but I'm not. 
So for those of you that are in the market, this is what a typical UPT job post will look like. Uh, it's not just these guys, they're having their board, but in general. So the hiring window for was from September 7th to March 31st. So it's ending here at the end of the month. The uh, POCs are the po'boy and machine. And here's the thing I want to point out. Read this. If you're applying and you are thinking about joining and you're rushing a squadron, attention to detail is like step one. The first step in your presentation to them. So if it says you need the following items in order, well, dude, I would not have your AFOQT and PCSM scores above your cover letter. You know, if it says you need a cover letter, you need a cover letter. If it says stating you're interested in interviewing for and outlining your qualifications, do that. That attention to detail is going to set the tone for how the rest of it goes. You know, it, it, it might not necessarily make you stand out, but it in a positive way, but it will in a negative way if you don't do it exactly the way they say to, because that's just part of the fighter business. You know, it's that we're going to talk about accountability later, but that attention to detail is kind of what you're being graded on from, from this, you know, this is one of those, um, tests, if you will. Now for the rated, there's pretty much nothing because we already have Wayne. You just need to call him and say, Hey, when can I visit? Uh, but check this out, uh, millrecruiter.com or, uh, the uh, other website, bogeydope.com. Bogeydope actually has um, all the Air AFRIC, the Air Force Reserve Command postings as well. And, and I've both, talked about that. Right? They have the UFT undergraduate flying training program. And there's a whole, if, it, if you look at the top left or top right, there's a whole UFT guidebook. And it tells you how, even if you're not interested in AFRIC, it just tells you how the process works, how you're going to get selected, how you end up um, going through the medical process how, you know, CISO slots are, are selected, how the uh, pilot slots are selected. All the stuff you ever wanted is right there. So you don't have to ask questions that have already been answered. So it's a good learning opportunity. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so I just wanted to talk about that real quick. Cause, uh, <laughs> and then uh, Wicked Spider Black says, have you two ever think of going to space? I tried the Hornet. <laughs> i started to run out of gas <laughs> uh i would i would go to space uh no. if that's elon musk asking i'd go no not me i said it last time any place you go where you take your helmet off and your eyeballs pop out of your head but that's not how it works we've, we've talked we, we talk about this every single time it's not how it works it kind of is huh? have you seen total recall okay so you're gonna see three boobs <laughs> let's hope not <laughs> garrett says uh earmuffs kids garrett says you need mooch on the podcast where would the drone be controlled the carrier how many can you possibly keep now it, garrett people is this, like mooch would be controlling the drone well, that, that's my question was this, <laughs> Just, was this a subtle jab at mooch that he would be the drone <laughs> operator garrett you oh. teed it up i just couldn't resist i i, I, I couldn't resist I, man i'm, I'm curious <laughs> What, uh, why these are this like a stream of consciousness? Or are you trying to say that he, he set is it the up, dude? All time drone operator for refueling <laughs> drones. Honestly, I go. think it would just be AI. You could just program the thing to do the thing. Like, you really don't, you just need a some kind of data link to tell it when to extend and begin fueling, which it could probably do it with a sensor once it knows you're plugged in. Dude, like, what else? We don't need those people, is what you're saying. We, we don't even need that. Yeah, we're just like here, <laughs> launch it off. It does its thing, and it'll see you later. Yeah, yeah. You need AI. Yeah, you need Gronk. <laughs> um. All right, let's get this train back on the track, shall we? Sure. <clears throat> is it my turn already? I it don't is. Know. What's next? Yeah, we're talking about the um. Our is it Singapore federal government. No, oh, we're no. talking about the federales. Oh, look at that. So, oh. in recent news, don't mess it up. Yeah, <laughs> I put the right pronounce spelling. Now, I'm not going to say I'm going to pronounce it right, no even though Reuters, Reuters did the old way. So, send all hate mail to them. Yeah, they said they spell it just like the bird. <laughs> the bird. <laughs> uh, U.S. Senate defeats bid to stop F 16 fighter jet sale to. Turkey. Did I do it right? 
Don't ask me, dude. Apparently, I don't know. Massive country <clears throat> of, of Turkey. And that's not sarcasm. No. Yeah. They're, they're a huge country. Just so you know. We've, we've learned from our ways. The U.S. Senate on Thursday soundly defeated an effort to stop the $23 billion sale of F-16s and modernization kits to Turkey. Remember we talked about this before, that they had approved uh, a whole bunch of stuff, right? F-35s to Greece, uh, the Hellenic Air Force. We talked about how that was kind of because they've got that uh, GNC stuff going on, and we're like, oh, that's kind of... But they're all NATO partners. And the reason we'll talk about actually the reason why here in the next segment about the, the S 400 and why they probably didn't get the F 35, but they had gotten a modernization. So they were going to be upgraded to kind of that block 70, what everybody else calls the Viper, even though they're all Vipers, uh, with the, the ESA radar and the, the new pods, the HDS pods, the missiles, everything you could Im imagine, both buying new jets off the factory, which obviously is good because it keeps the factory going. And then also um, modernization. But the Senate, sponsored by Rand Paul, had tried to block it, saying that uh, the sale would embolden misbehavior. And the backers of the sale said it's important for Washington to keep its word for a NATO ally. And basically, uh, the vote went uh, 79 to 13. So it really wasn't party lines. It was pretty... Um, I mean... Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty big margin. Biden administration had informed Congress on January 26th of its intent to proceed with the sale of 40 F-16s and 80 modernization kits to Turkey a day after they fully completed ratification and NATO membership of Sweden. So that might have been part of the deal. Hey, if you ratify Sweden, the sale had been held up for months, issues including refusing to approve Sweden's accession to the military alliance. Turkey first asked to make the purchase in October of 21. So this has been going for a while. You know, you're, you're talking the better part of two years. U.S. Arms Expert Control Acts give Congress the right to stop a major weapons sale by passing a resolution of disapproval in both the Senate and the House. Although laws have been in effect for half a century, no such resolution has passed both has, has both passed Congress and survived a veto. So odds are if that would have happened, he would have just vetoed it anyway. Sweden and Finland applied to enter NATO after Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. Finnish membership was sealed last year. Sweden's been was held up by Turkey and Hungary. Uh, all NATO members need approve, rev, av, approve applications from countries seeking to join the alliance. So um, we, we've talked about the good and the bad, right? For now, they are NATO allies, and I'm not, I don't think that's going to change. I'm just saying as the, as the current sit, as it sits, they are NATO allies. And as such, if you're going to say they're NATO allies, then we have to support our NATO partners. Yeah, the only thing that, I mean, I, I'm i a huge supporter of just doing business instead of war with the entire world. <clears throat> yeah. But I do find it strange that, and I guess, I mean, we're going to talk about it a little bit more later, but, you know, we're not going to sell you other F-35s because you bought the S-400, but we are going to sell you F-16s with the modernization kits. So, you know, I mean, the F-16, you know, the, the ones they're getting with, with the more modern ones is a pretty advanced airplane. I mean, it's not yeah. an F-35, but it's an advanced airplane. And I just think it's strange that like, okay, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to uh, penalize a country like Turkey for buying an S-400, then I'm surprised it's not including the F-16. Like, no, you guys well, want to play with the Russians? That's fine. But I, I, I understand their NATO ally. I just, I just find it interesting. That's all. Yeah. But I think the logic is not necessarily punishment is exploitation, right? You oh, have, if you have Russian partners that are giving us 400s, the Russians who are on the ground are going to take that and use it to exploit the F 30. They're going to test it against it. hundred percent. They will get all the data and we don't want that. The F 16 has been around and remember we're not producing the F-16 for ourselves anymore. They, not a single F-16 that rolls off the assembly line goes to the U.S. anymore. The only F-16s now, do I agree with that? No, I think we should buy, I think we should buy, you know, squadrons worth of them, mini squadrons. But as of right now, every F-16 that rolls off the lot is foreign material sales. It's, a, it's an export version. So they're already getting what the U.S. State Department has approved technology-wise for them to get. 
So it's it's and it, and it's no different than any other country, right? It's not it's not the F thirty five technology that we talk about. It's it's F sixteen technology that is specific to them. So I just, I understand that, but you know yeah. there 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 is technology there that I, I it just surprises me that uh, they would pick and choose like that. I mean I, I understand the F thirty five S four hundred, sure, but uh, you know I consider the F sixteen still a very uh, lethal weapon in the game of it, it is, but again, it's the export version of the yeah, F-16. It's, oh, it's the, it's the one that's being built specifically for these countries. I mean, Taiwan's getting them. So oh, I think I Singapore is also getting them, yep. you know, all of these allied countries are, are buying the exact same and all they're doing is giving modernization kits and brand new jets. Now, granted the technology has caught up, so that these F-16s are just as good as ours, but the trump card is we've still got the F-35, we've got the F-22, we've got the F-15EX, U.S. versions and stuff like that. So, you know. yeah, I don't know. I just, yeah. I just still think it's weird, but uh, that's just my own opinion. I, I'm, I'm glad they're getting them, man. I well, and we're going to talk about that here in the next or in a future segment uh, about the reason that that might change right the <clears throat> f-35 thing might might change because they're kind of changing their tune a little bit as well but we'll see uh all right going to the audience see if there's anything turkey the usa's second choice for national bird <laughs> janitor's back <laughs> thanks man mj says pronounce turkey turkey okay thanks, is it MJ. turkey a turkey a or turkey a turkey or turkey a we're just pilots mj like we're not that turkey smart a. <laughs> hey i can't <laughs> may the fonz be with you yes thank you though hey dg says mover can you tell me in a roundabout way if i should give up on trying to get you back in the cockpit <laughs> I, are, are you trying to get if i mean hey yeah. i'll fly i'll fly hell yeah i'll fly <laughs> don't don't give up on mover uh, <laughs> the old dog still has some life left in him yeah <laughs> uh, look i will be 60 flying out of my airstream if i have to no don't don't stop believing like me and penny benjamin will do barrel rolls into the sunset if we need to yeah although i yeah. guess you're more maverick than i am i'm i'm iron eagle six uh yeah, you're well. Gosh, Masters. Masters. He's he didn't make it, did he? You know, I relate. Yeah, he did. He came back. Uh, I related to him because in like <laughs> when he came back and like the one with the World War II birds and the kids, he's like, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an adult. When I was an adult, I wanted to stay an adult. I hated kids. I don't like kids. I'm like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> he came this back man, in that one. Yeah, he came back from that. He was never dead. Oh man, I'm gonna have they to killed him in, all my... in two, and then they brought him back to life. It turns out he was just a POW. <clears throat> next, uh, yeah, Spoiler next TDY alert. from hell we have Mover we're gonna, instead, of, instead of Airwolf yeah. series, we'll have to watch. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Okay, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> T Wolf Jaeger says Turkey has been spelled and pronounced Turkey, yeah, in Turkish since the country became a republic in 1923. Okay. I feel like it's more recent than that. <laughs> anyway, uh, DJ, don't stop believing. <laughs> Let's just we'll go back to that that one. It's just it's a it's an uphill battle. I'm just it's uphill. <laughs> it's not it's not an easy sell. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> got nothing he's like yeah sure we'll probably just stick to youtube for now <laughs> uh gonky why don't you talk about the singapore yeah. buys f-35 and yeah and so singapore uh it's a it's a country and a city all in one right i mean it's uh for such well and this is a small country i know this because i've been there <laughs> <laughs> they have a pretty formidable air force so they're buying uh they're buying F-35s. And I, I actually, until I read this article and did a little deep dive, I didn't know that they are buying the A and B <clears throat> version. So they apparently they bought the B and now they're buying <clears throat> buying the A. And obviously the reasons are because of the the tensions in the area, right? So that's you know, China's right there. And when I was in Malaysia, you know, even the Malaysians were uh, I don't want to say nervous, but they definitely kept their thumb on the pulse with what 
China was doing because in uh, Eastern Malaysia, they had all their oil and stuff. And um, the Malaysians and the Singaporeans actually used to be all one big happy country and family and they split. And so uh, I know Malaysia would kind of compete with Singapore as far as uh, border, um, like flying airplanes along the border, just kind of keeping each other in check. So I, <clears throat> I read this article and I just thought that, man, this is probably going to cause the other mil air forces in the region to also raise their game, which overall might be good if you're trying to keep a country like uh, China on its toes, yep. or maybe at bay, but uh, Singapore has for, for, I, uh, like I said, it is geographically, it is a small country. Uh, it, they've, they've got a pretty powerful, uh, they have a very powerful air force and we were there. We, the Stennis pulled in there and, Oh, six oh seven whenever i was there and i mean you know not only do they have a really awesome fighter force but they got apaches and uh, they don't mess around so and they're a very disciplined uh, very clean neat orderly uh people and country so uh it's i i, I think the f-35 will suit them well yeah and it says there you know they're noting the growing capabilities of the Chinese People's Liberation Army Air Force, which has begun, uh, you know, flying the J-20. You, you yeah. have to counter the threat, and that's how you do it. You, you piece your superior firepower, piece your strength. Yeah, yeah 100%. I mean, I mean, that's, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, China has stuff they can reach out and, and if you're yeah. in that region, they've got stuff they can reach out and, and get you. So, I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have some pretty high powered stuff and you know, they're getting it. So that's good. I mean, yeah. I have, you ever Not, done any training with the Singaporeans mover? I think they were in uh, Luke. I haven't done training yeah. with them, but I know people that flew the Viper like yeah. with them and stuff yeah. when they were at Luke. Um, but no, I've never flown directly with them. So here's the question. What is their, and this might be a little bit too geopolitical, but what is their take on the whole Taiwan stuff and China's insistent assistance in their one China policy? And, and would they become involved? Right. Because it, that that's the first domino. If you start talking a Pacific theater front. Yeah. I th honestly, or, man, I think they're too far to do. Is it just um, deterrence for, you know, e expansion? Yeah, you know, are they're, they are they going to donate their their jets to uh, that kind of cause? I I it's my belief. It could, I could be wrong, but <clears throat> having spent some time there in that area, flying uh, a lot mm -hmm. of those uh, countries tend to have more of a defensive mindset. Yeah. So they're going to preserve uh, what they have. Now, some of their interests, you know, maybe beyond, you know, their actual real estate, you know, like, right. for example, Mal like I one time the Malaysians let me go on their deployment with them. And uh, a lot of the areas we patrolled were out over the water because a lot of the oil wells and fields and stuff were they were, you know, uh, rigs out, you know, out uh, in the ocean. But that was, you know, their sea space. So, yeah. I, you know, Singapore, there's all kinds of commerce and money stuff going on there. You know, the port's real mm -hmm. active. So I don't know if, uh, you know, how much of that they would, that they would probably try to keep that going because Singapore has no natural resources. Oh. It's, it's, it's literally, I joke, it's a country and a city all in one because it is. Uh, <clears throat> they don't have any natural resources. They're, uh, you know, they make their money, you know, via, via business and commerce and stuff. So, uh, it's important for them to keep all that, keep all that open. So I would think that that's probably, you know, defensive in nature and keeping, keeping that open for them. Yeah. I mean, just making one more hard target in that area. So they're not susceptible to anything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Didn't I'm mean, just as an aside, wasn't Malaysia involved in Somalia in the Mogadishu uh, in 1993? Weren't they part of that UN force that actually helped <clears throat> save the the Rangers? I don't know. I don't Seems know. Like man. I remember Malaysia was involved in that. I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, so crazy Pete says you're, now you're bullying Singapore. It is sad, actually. You're I love Singapore. We, uh, we no, party. Uh, we party. 
Santosa Island is is where we stayed, uh, and it was it was a it was amazing. Uh, I loved it. Very expensive cab rides, but other than that, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. They don't sell guns there. <laughs> okay, MJ says that's one of the diminishing benefits of being an Aussie. No one expects us to be able to pronounce anything correctly. <laughs> oi, oi. Same with us who live in the South. Damn right. <laughs> Cal Naughton Jr. said, I mean, Cal Neighbor Nabauer <laughs> says, thoughts on the Bombardier 8000? The hell is that? I don't know. Now they're just making up numbers. It's probably better than the 6000. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know anything about it. I don't know. All right. Well, Gonky, moving on to the next thing that I would like oh, to talk wow. about to you tonight. So. God, it really is. And so we took a little bit of uh, hate when we bu- when you bullied the um, dude, the French. I don't bully the French. Str- the, <laughs> the French in there were foul. Remember, we did that video. You got us canceled. That's actually the video that got us canceled. So please don't say those words again. Is it the one where he fought the raptor? Yes. And the raptor kind of graped around and everybody's like, oh, two tanks? The raptor so, yeah, it was, it, <laughs> he was pulling like three G's and there the were fouls like nine and a half g's and his g strain was a little high pitched a little bit on the high pitch side i thought it was a little bit who's bullying now it's just a debrief it's a debrief it doesn't mean but listen in this article at this time now um i am not bullying the french because i am excited for them for their first french rafale f 4.1, 4.1, it reached IOC and our initial operational capability. And that's an important milestone. We had uh, the Air Force engineer, Rick Abel, on the channel. And we talked about kind of the milestones and it's kind of universal, right? They start out, you know, in the initial test, then they go to operational test, then it's IOC, and then it's fully mission capable. And, or FOC, I think is, is what they're calling it here. But so the, the article says it's, upgraded to a 4.1 standard which is actually they're just modernizing you know you're getting into that closer to that gen 4.5 where you're in this sensor network uh there's a data link they've got um i think it talks about it here yeah so it's uh new satellite intra patrol links communication server software radio a new helmet mounted site uh, a one ton precision guided bomb the hammer which isn't that a cool name uh, improvements to the air to air and air to ground targeting systems, enhancements to the self protection system, integration of the Alios targeting long range identification, optronic system targeting pod. And that's important too, because it's always a good thing. Tactically speaking, when you can reach out and see something or target something with just optics with an IR an Erst, something like that. So, Really cool capabilities, a substantial improvement uh, for the backbone of the French Air Force. And uh, they're going to prepare and operate alongside uh, French, France, Germany, and Spain. They'll, they'll be equipped for a high-intensity conflict and one of the priorities of their new planning law from 2024. But that's a good-looking airplane. And, and going back to what we were just talking about, it takes nothing away when we talk about the Raptor thing. It's a badass machine. High AOA, pulls nine Gs, has a great turn rate, both instantaneous and sustained. It's a performer, performing aircraft. And when you upgrade the sensors, more modern, you know, get the color displays, get the moving maps, get the data link, get the targeting systems. Now you've just made a more capable ally in future conflicts, which is important in Europe because, again, we've got a hot spot in Ukraine. Everybody's worried about it spilling out. The stronger the allies are, the better off everyone is. And upgrading it is important to keep up with new tech. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of countries developing, you know, their own weapons. I mean, the <clears throat> the French built the Rafale because they were tired of messing around with the Typhoon. And, you know, they built a really good airplane. And it's good to see them continue to advance it. And I'm sure, you know, the sales to India and other countries have, have yeah. helped because this ain't cheap, right? I mean... In France, that's what I was going to ask you about actually is the didn't we do an article about them selling it to India because India yeah. said no to the Super Hornet? Yeah, the Indian chose it, which the Indian so the Indian Navy chose the Rafale over the Super Hornet, and but the Indian Air Force had already been flying the Rafale. So the there's a carrier and <clears throat> uh, non carrier 
uh, mission that it can do. Um, it's one airplane I've always, I've always wanted to fly. I'd never, so uh, my buddy Kunte in Malaysia, he flew it and he, <laughs> he's like, oh man, it's like a Ferrari. <laughs> like, I believe it. I'm like, what I does mean, that mean? He, he's like, oh man, it's, it's just so fast. <laughs> It's a it's a good looking airplane. Yeah. It, it performs really well. And my question then is, so is it like, like the midlife upgrade, right? We took older F-16s and we upgraded them, especially the export versions. We upgraded them to kind of a block 50, block 52 standard, you know, Super Hornet, you can change the OFP and, and upgrade them. Is it something like this? Or is this like the Super Hornet where it's a whole new airplane and you can't retrofit to the older models? No, it's uh I'm ninety nine percent sure it's not a whole new airplane. The, the Super Hornet is a yeah uh, from the intakes back basically is a completely different airframe. Um the uh the Rafal is uh they've upgraded, you know, the the innards, which I mean in modern fighter fighter planes, that's what yeah, I mean, that's, I, that's and we did that of, and you did that you see that with the F sixteen, yeah, you know, the 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 some of the the external hardware is different between yep. you know block 40 block 50 block 30 but then you know the block 40 they call it mmc jets the block 40s and 50s all share that same software the block 30s were the SKU, um so they had their own software and they upgraded them separately so yeah. if that's the case then that means these newer jets that are coming out the the indian versions and export versions and stuff like that will be able to be upgraded as well as time goes on and and they're fully confident with it. So, I mean, good yeah. for them. Yeah. We, we actually, uh, the Charles de Gaulle, I mentioned it a while back, but the Charles de Gaulle came out and we did some exercises with them and the Rafal was there. And, uh, I did, I fought them BVR, uh, but Beyond I didn't get, range. yeah, sorry. And then I, I didn't get to dogfight with any, but you know, a bunch of the guys did get to do BFM <clears throat> with the Rafal and, it's, it's, it's very much like a, and I, I flew a uh, older a lot at, back then, even they were older, a lot, 10 Charlie regular Hornets, legendary legacy Hornets. Yeah. And they were very comparable. Uh, so, and I honestly, I don't know like what variant of the Rafal the French Navy was flying back then, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it's kind of kept on step uh, with like super Hornet, as far as like a lot of the radar and, counter yeah. like you know that kind of stuff so well I, i'd also be interested to see how it changes the performance because they didn't talk yeah. about any engine upgrades right and that yeah. happens a lot of times like block 40 was a victim of this block fit as you start getting more advanced tech you add weight and so the uh and it matters the, the within visual range yeah. gets worse yeah for just basic dog fighting and by basic dog fighting i mean guns which rarely happens now you've got a helmet you don't need it you know you've got a good missile you've got a helmet okay but performance wise you know it, it's it loses just a little bit but gains i would much rather if i'm you know if i'm the rafale pilot i'm like give me the toys because that's what's gonna be better in war because we're gonna do a we're going to, it's, it's a different landscape. You're not going to go to that merge with yeah. just the gun. Hopefully. Hopefully. Well, the, yeah. The question is always when people ask me which version of the super Horn or which version of the Hornet is your favorite. I'm like, what are we doing? Are we going yeah. to war or are we going to play? Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, and, and, and so I think other people might talk about, cause it's gen 4.5 when they're talking about electronic countermeasures too, the French are very good at electronic attack jamming, all that stuff. So those, I think they're going to get upgrades in that as well. I think that's probably, you know, part of it is, is all of their, their sensor fusion and, and all that, um, you know, self-protection capability that maybe negates the need for a stealthier aircraft and keeps them survivable in a, in a conflict. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I don't know what the French doctrine is i mean yeah. are they more defensive or are they off you know what i'm saying so i mean they well, have an aircraft carrier so they do have power projection but um, yeah and it said you know patrols airborne patrols and stuff like that but i mean they've been out i mean they're they've been out in, in conflicts you know they've been they've been fighting in you know middle east you know they've done yeah 
plenty of that's stuff. What, yeah. That's what they were doing when we were working yeah. with them. They yeah. were they were out there, uh, you know, doing yeah. OEF. Uh, yeah, I don't know OEF or OIF, one of them. But yeah, I I would man, I love. I'm superficial, man. It's good looking airplane. Dude. I'd love to fly it. What well, looks? I'd love to see a Gripen next to it. I you know the new the new Gripen E. I would love because they look yeah. they, you know the they yeah. look very similar. I'd fly, fly the Gripen too. Yeah. Hey, people you, are listening. hey, listen, <laughs> keep keep don't give up on us. You can give up on Gonky. <laughs> yeah. Don't give up on Mover. Uh yeah. Uh, Janitor's back says, and the Rafal can uh, land on the U.S. carriers. That's true. I saw it with my own with my own eyes. What is the what what does that what's the delineation like? What what determines whether you can land on a U.S. carrier or not? That's a great question, man. I, I like from a from a equipment standpoint, I would think you just need a hook and some sort of light device on the front so the LSOs can confirm that you are flying the appropriate angle of attack slash speed <clears throat> to come aboard. Uh, though I don't remember. <clears throat> They may have done it since then, but pretty sure they were doing all touch and goes. And our guys, I didn't get it. I didn't get to go over there and do it, but our guys were doing touch and goes as well. I don't think anybody was was hooked on their down. ship. Yeah. Wow. And they, they short do, ships, right? They don't. They just. It, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and what was we? Gosh, I'm really digging because that was a long time ago. But um, what I thought was pretty amazing about them was like when we. If anybody knows in the comments, feel free to correct me <clears throat> if I'm wrong, but. Uh, and mover, you remember because you talked about this sim that was kind of hard for for CQ, but we would calculate our push time, yeah. like for the night stuff, cat three, whatever. So mm -hmm. we would calculate our push time, which when flown correctly, correctly would dictate you know the interval at trap. The French uh calculate their like over the ramp time, <laughs> which to me is like, how the hell do you do that? I, uh, we had a, we had a French, we had, we had, uh, a couple French pilots come over and hang out in our ready room and we sent a couple guys over. They have bars on their ships. Just so you know. Nice. They, yeah. They're doing it better than we are. I think there's three bars on the ship. I don't drink. So I was like, all right, when do you guys go live it up? And, uh, they brought a couple French, uh, pilots over and we, you know, we we're just learning about, uh, one another. And, you know, it, there was, there were some differences with, with procedures but at the end of the day you're still landing land a jet on a ship so yeah no that's awesome yeah cool. all right moving on to our uh next topic um gonky you get what to say that? the name just for your hate mail dude i'm gonna say it like we do here in the south turkey um it's no disrespect i don't we don't hey <laughs> we don't even know how to say it correctly <laughs> until somebody calls in you know what somebody call in leave us a message for next week and educate us on this <laughs> go i'm not cyberbullying here i'm being honest well yeah so we've kind of added move we've kind of talked about this article already through the other things we've talked about but hey will turkey ditch the s400s for f35s basically so it's a bit of a long article, but if you read through it, it basically talks about their decision uh, to buy the S four hundred. You know, they were Turkey was in on the on the F thirty five development and buy in, and then they got essentially they got kicked out, which is what then sparked their uh, desire uh, and to build their own fifth gen fighter, which we've talked about the Con, which just did its maiden flight about a week ago or so. Uh, but apparently getting the F-35 is still on the table. There's some talk about, Hey, that was a big mistake. We shouldn't have done that. So, you know, if they decide <clears throat> to, uh, not go through with buying the S 400, uh, I guess that it's possible they could still, uh, they could be let back in to the F-35 program, but uh, I'm sure there's a ton of politics involved uh, you know, between that decision happening or not, but, uh, it's still on the table and it, you know, it's really, I, the way the article reads is kind of turkey if they want to do it or not. Doug, did I miss anything in there? I know you read through it. It's kind of long. So diplomatic yeah. catastrophe. That's that yeah. Those are the important details. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. called it a, a diplomatic catastrophe. Oh, and I wanted to say in here, they did say that the, uh, F-16 was inferior to the F-35. Just wanted Mover to hear that. 
Um, <laughs> that's your opinion. <laughs> it's not my opinion. It's, <laughs> um, whoever wrote this is, is a <laughs> RFI. There it is. But is the F-16 is inferior to the F-35. Yeah, you can you can just go ahead and take that down. <laughs> We're not this is fake about news, it. but <laughs> according to Mover, I don't this know. Is, what, what, it's not not deep intel at all. You know, I would think it'd be way easier and cheaper to develop to develop your own SAM system than a fifth gen fighter. So if I was Turkey. <laughs> well, why, why don't they want like the HIMARS or or whatever? Like, why didn't they want Patriot U.S. missiles? Yeah, what 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 is the why of all? So, what does Turkey That's fly? Question. Do they have what? F-16. Do they have any other Russian ties? Is this the first Russian <laughs> equipment that they would? I I mean, as far as modern stuff, yeah. I mean, they're trying to modernize, right? So, I mean, everybody's apparently you know trying to get on the fifth gen bandwagon but i mean like given the choice i would say it'd be a lot easier and and you bring up a good point mover uh you know stay in the f-35 program and then go buy a you know a surface air missile from somebody else not russian you know yeah so i'm looking you know however realistic you know wikipedia is and and thing but they don't have as far as the air force goes they have nothing in, that's russian right so their inventory of aircraft has no russian ties so i guess from a diplomatic stance if if you're gonna all of a sudden do that it does race to my brows right because it's not like sure. they have an established relationship like malaysia malaysia you know they're flying Big 29s, flankers, and then they got the Hornets, and, and then they're trying to move on. It's not a mixed fleet where they've already got this established relationship with Russia and they're trying to kind of diversify and all this. They're a NATO ally that has most as Western equipment, and all of a sudden you're buying a double digit SAM or for the kids at home, you know, for S400. To explain that, we usually think of SA, you know, 10, 20, 15. We don't Bad. use S400 <laughs> moniker in our right. lives because that's just not nato but so all of a sudden they're doing this and so there's two ways that can go it can be exploitation for turkey against the s400 or it can be exploitation the other way and if if you're saying it's a diplomatic strain then the assumption is they want this f-35 and they're going to go hand off the data to their their new friends and that's a bad thing you know when you're a nato ally you don't want to be the whole point of nato was against the warsaw pact right i mean it's it's the Defending well, and it, Russia, and it's like you said. I mean, they're going to get the export version of the F thirty five, you know, kind of like the export version of the F sixteen. I mean, but at the same time, I agree with you, man. I it, it does raise some eyebrows if you're yeah. if you're if you got Western equipment and you're like, hey, why do you want to go buy this, you know, Russian high end SAM system? But yeah, uh, it, it probably politics involved. Um, oh, not probably. A hundred percent. Oh, there's definitely politics involved. Probably yeah. some money floating around there. Um, yeah, it's just too bad. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah, okay. We got some, uh, let's see, do we have anything from the kids at home? Uh, Diane D2 says, Have you guys talked about Masters of the Air yet? I'm a bit behind. That show is breaking me. The forts. And flight crew are amazing. I don't have Apple, whatever Apple TV. I don't either. I've watched. Uh, I've actually watched. There's a lot of clips you can watch <clears throat> on the YouTube's oh, that I've YouTube's. seen. And uh, and uh, yeah, I mean the storyline stuff I've seen so far is really good. I'm a, I'm a little disappointed with the with. The, I mean I know you, you they have to use computer generated graphics, but that always takes away a little bit for me yeah i haven't i have not i have like i've seen the trailer that's it i'm not seeing yeah. anything um cluterus says mover you try out the rain and i renting yet it's talking about i racing i have not oh. done any gaming in a while so no i'm not i need to um Moving on. It's bad news, Gonky. Mm. 
I forgot the overlay for the last however long, so everybody's going to be like, why is this a week old? Bad news, Gonky. A tornado has damaged Wright Pat Air Force Base in the yeah. um, uh, museum. museum. Yeah. Yeah, they had a tornado uh, roll through and it damaged a bunch of, they had a, what, some Century Series fighters there. And um, I mean, good thing, I, but there was no, I mean, thankfully nobody got killed, but, you know, some of that, they're not building those planes anymore. <laughs> You know, once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, look at that, man. It really tore up that building. Yeah. Um, and from what I understand, let's see, go back to the email. Have you been there? Have you ever been there? Um, yes, it's a great place. An F-101 and T-33 were damaged. Uh, were slated to be scrapped before the tornado. Yeah. Uh, so. A-26 Invader, F-104, obviously, T-33. Um, yeah. They had, they, I mean, there's a lot of damage, and that stuff is... Uh, <clears throat> you know, if it's anything, you know, I, I live down here in the Panhandle. We got the Naval Aviation Museum. A lot of times those airplanes are there on loan from different places. Yeah. So and that that's probably why those two were scheduled to be scrapped before. Oh, look, it says that right there, the T-33 trainer and stuff like that. But there it is. Uh, God, that, I mean, it just goes to show you how, you know, precious our history is and how you know within moments it can all be gone right you know we, we try to preserve these aircraft preserve the history and then the next thing you know a natural disaster happens and yeah you know, there, there's no warning there it's not like a hurricane where you can hurry back i mean it, it, even if you could hurry back i mean I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're they're not in a condition you could move them but i mean what do you do i've I mean, you do your best, right? I mean, I, I remember a couple of years ago at the Corvette Museum, the National Corvette Museum. Oh, the, the sinkhole. Sink, the sinkhole, the man. Sink hole. Like... I went there after. Doug and I went there after. Remember that, Doug? Yeah, they wouldn't let us go down in the sinkhole. <laughs> is it still there? Uh, is, no. I want to say that, that there's a floor over it, and but they have cars that were in it that they pulled out and left in, in their state that they were in the sinkhole. It's pretty awful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, anytime, I mean, it, you know, anytime, like, you know, if, uh, you know, paintings or any kind of artwork, I mean, I, I, I mean, these were war planes, but I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're engineering art, right. At the time they were like cutting edge and it's just, uh, it's sad to see any kind of, uh, the history art yeah, artifacts from the past really, uh, be destroyed because, you know, then, you know, then like, I can't take my kid there to see it. Right. And, seeing it on TV is one thing, but actually seeing it in person and being able to, you know, get up close and look at it and like, look in the cockpit and be like, man, people got in these things, you know? Well, it, it's like the SR 71. Like you yeah. don't realize the size is smaller than you think. And you look at it and you're like, people got in this thing. Like the yeah. cockpit is so cramped, especially in the, the back. And the airplane is massive. Yeah. But like you yeah. look at it and you're like, Okay, it's this big airplane, and then the small, tiny cockpit, and you're like, "Wow, dude, this thing, uh, you know, oh, wow." Yep. And then the space shuttle, like I went to the museum at Dulles, at the airport, uh, when I went to a school last year, and the space shuttle is massive. I mean, the, the, thing the, is, co the cockpit? No, just the airplane. Oh, the yeah, actual yeah, shuttle. Yeah. You know, it's in this this open area. They wouldn't let you into the cockpit, but you know, the you just don't. You're right. You don't get that sense of it's not real unless you can touch it kind of thing, you know, and, and, yeah. and see it up close. And this is our heritage, but it's also, I mean, how many museums did you go to as a kid? This is what inspires the next generation. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and I mean, air shows and museums. Yeah. 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 I don't know, man. I mean, hopefully, <clears throat> you know, uh, Hopefully they can rebuild, you know, some of the, you know, if they can repair yeah. the ones they can repair, but at the, you know, it's always a, a lot in, you know, a lot of like the, you know, a lot of the warbirds you see flying, it's a lot of it's volunteer, yeah. right? It's not really funded. Right. So, and, uh, and it, it becomes a, a, a cost issue, unfortunately. And sometimes it's like, we just can't, we just have the money to bring this thing back. Well, that reminds me of the, uh, AN 225, the Ukrainian. Oh, yeah. Uh, one it was what it, if not the last one, one of the last ones. Yeah, I got and up. Uh, yeah, and the airstrike took it out or the the base attack, and so Microsoft Flight Sim 
made a module and the funds from that module are going to try to rebuild this thing eventually whether it happens or not i don't know wow but that's you're talking about the money piece like there are creative ways they're trying to do it now granted this is a one of a one of like you know two yeah or, i mean there are not many um, did you did you see the video of it that thing is tore i mean that thing is tore up yeah but that versus the t-33 which they're still yeah. civilian t-33s flying around you know they're yeah. still f-100s and f-101 like some things are you the only way to get it back is to refurbish it and some things are like well there's other ones that maybe can be donated like if a t-38's in the museum you can get another one in fact they're still flying you know <laughs> but if it's something more rare like an sr-71 or yeah. a, a space XB 70 right yeah yeah or, or, or yeah, I mean that's a good point. You know, some of these original they made like, like one actual historic, <laughs> right? And it was this is the one that was used on this date. Yeah. Like to me it's not just the airplane but it's the story behind it. Oh, you know, 100%. You you, you 100%. get to see kind of what they did. So, um, You go to the museum here in Pensacola and it's like uh uh, right next to the you know hey this is a whatever a p-40 warhawk and then it's like you know this airplane was involved in the battle of empty Fred and you like you know as a as a as a kid man you can just it i mean as even as an adult it blows my mind yeah you know? yeah because you can just you, you picture it you picture that story you picture kind of what that pilot must have gone through it and yeah uh, i have more of an appreciation for it now than i did when i was a kid Hundred right? percent. When I was a kid, it's just oh buttons, you know, flip the switch and all that stuff. But then now, having done it, you're like, I can, I, I, I can picture it. Yeah. When I was the kid, I was like, oh, just like in Bob Bob Black Sheep, you know. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> you know. But now I realize there's actual a lot of horror and you yeah. know bad stuff going on. But yeah, you're right, man. I, yeah, it's sad. Yeah. All right, uh, Gonky. Yes, it's sir. Tenth anniversary of yeah. Malaysian. <laughs> Uh, airlines think, 370 yeah i think march 8th uh and uh, we did a little thing a while back about this and you know i i was there my in-laws uh were on a flight out of penang the same night that this triple seven took off out of penang so the next day was a little hairy for a couple of minutes for us when we saw that uh, a airliner had disappeared so basically they haven't got much uh, you know, the families haven't had much in the way of closure, right? Because it's still kind of, well, it's a mystery. Um, there's some new technologies available, Ocean Infinity and stuff that like, you know, hey, maybe we found it <clears throat> here, you know, using some new techniques. So there's talk of reviving the uh, the search for it. I read somewhere where I'd like, uh, they spent something like $170 million looking for it. And That's then they, insane. They, yeah, then they That's finally... Insane. They finally quit. I I mean, not for the people. I mean, obviously, there's no cost yeah. to get the people back. I'm just saying that is a lot of money. That, that's a solid effort. Yeah. Uh, my only question, like I said, I was there and I I, uh, I knew I knew the very next day, you know, which direction that airplane went. And I sat for two weeks and watched why the entire world looked somewhere off the coast of Vietnam for this thing. And that's the question in my mind. So, you know, people are like, you know, what happened to MH370? I want to know. I want to know why the whole world for two weeks was looking somewhere else and who like who is the point person that caused that i i you know some people oh, it's the malaysian government and their incompetence i i disagree <laughs> um well because you you know that the malaysian government knew right you were yeah they you know that they knew not to, they knew where it was dude i showed up to work and they had all the guys were there all the jets had three tanks on them and i'm like whoa what's going on and they're like oh man we went out and looked for mh370 i'm like you went to vietnam <laughs> you know they're like nah man we went you know the other way and i was like why <laughs> you know because i'd watch the news i'm like yeah. i'm like you got the compass backwards what's going on and uh yeah i mean you know i i I don't know. Like I said, that's the question in my mind. So for like literally two weeks, I'm watching the news. They're like, oh, we're looking off the coast of 
Vietnam and it's this is the flight path it took. I'm like, oh no, no, it didn't. <laughs> so there's uh I mean I'm what and there was there, there's discrepancies, you know. They, they did uh about what six months ago they did a uh they did a, a special, I can't remember who did it, uh on MH370. And it was basically, you know, conspiracy theorist. Well, kind of well kind. hold on, you got a chat for conspiracy theories. Uh, Eric says <laughs> MH370 condolences to the families of those involved. The jet was brought down by a Thail star streak system of Malaysia and blamed on a UFO abduction. I don't think so, man. I don't, there, there were, uh, there, there were a lot, there were discrepancies and the fact that, uh, they were smoke screening that airplane's actual flight path for two weeks <clears throat> tells me that there was in my mind, man, if I like, I, I, I think there was some criminal crazy stuff going on. I think that airplane landed somewhere. It either landed in the water, uh, like on purpose, uh, for some reason, or it landed somewhere and it you know, got drugged into a hangar. That's my own. Oh, you think they're still, they could dude, be still there. Mover. That's I, a lot of how, people. How do you lose? Yeah, but okay. So I get it, the, the Marines can lose an F-35. I get it. But how you, do you, but, lose? right. <laughs> but, but, but okay. So anytime, it's like say it's like the whole 911 and I'm so glad this is on your channel. It's like the whole 911 <laughs> uh, conspiracy theories, right? It's it's like at some point you have to go, okay, how did so many people if if this is a conspiracy and this is this scale, how do so many people stay quiet? Like how do you cuz remember some of the 911 conspiracies are the same thing, right? That they landed and it was a cruise missile and it really wasn't a jet and they landed somewhere and and, and all that stuff. So uh, how would you keep that many people quiet after 10 years? Money. I don't know. 239 people. And, Mover, I'm and not look, dude, I don't I don't have all the answers. All all I know is when I was there, like I was literally bouncing my head off the wall, you know, cuz like, oh, the world is looking for me. I'm like, you're looking in the wrong freaking area, dude. You know? So they weren't looking at I mean, so you're the Hornets when you when they said they were looking, where were they looking? They went west. <clears throat> so they went to the correct place. So at yes. least, so it's not that they weren't looking; it's that they weren't telling the world where they were looking. Yeah, for whatever reason, that information is not shared, dude. And I'll I'll tell you, like, uh, you're not going to sit here and tell me the Singaporeans didn't watch what was going on. You're going to say, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's yeah. just you know, I, I don't know everyone's capabilities uh, and I, this is a little bit of speculation, but as a guy flying tactical jets in that area um, and, you know, having an idea of their, their capabilities and military capabilities in general. Um, and what I saw with my own eyes, uh, I, I asked the question who and why uh, did, did the smoke screen exist as far as like hey everybody look over here for a while why i don't know so have you seen this document john says a netflix time documentary I think that's it. Plane that disappeared does talk about internal government cover-up yeah and i you know i uh is the malaysian government involved maybe i don't know but i don't think i you know it's my own opinion i don't i don't think it was uh i don't think it was all them or i don't even really think that they had a whole lot to do with it, but that's just, dude, that's just gonky. I'm just, you know, this is all just jokes and, um, good okay. times. And I'm just you telling you what I saw, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Don't. don't yeah. No, okay. Yeah. Exactly. I'm mentally this stable. Show, perfectly this, happy. This, this is not a news <laughs> channel. No, this is, <laughs> this, is this is a ready room. Yeah. Ready room environment purposes only. Good, but uh, mover, put hey, put yourself in my shoes, man. You come to work, right? You saw, you see, you drink your coffee in the morning. You're like, oh my gosh, that thing went over there and disappeared. Then you go to work, and the very, you know, all the jets are like long range set up, and you're like, why? What the hell's oh, going no, on? No, dude, I, I, I'm not. Look, I, I just don't think it's aliens. That's that's oh, what I'm gonna be reasonably confident because you have seen that video. With, uh, <laughs> where they're like, we've got a high res satellite video of these little things and it disappears. And I'm like, that's the stupidest, fakest thing. How'd you get access to a classified satellite? Yeah. 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 You know, the, the sad also, thing is, is, 
Well, yeah. the, the sad part, man, is like no matter what, I unfortunately I do believe you know I, I think those people are gone. That's the sad part. So, um, and really at the end of the day, you know, after answering the question, you know, why and who authorized the whole look over here, you know, there needs to be closure for the well, families, man. So I guess it could it be because Gonky, you know how incompetent government can be at any level. <laughs> so how no. many times have you had mixed messaging where, yeah. you know, one, the right hand's not talking to the left hand. So, I mean, could it just be as, as simple as, you know, the military knew to go look this way. The civilian authorities had this theory. Nobody's not two, talking. Not for two weeks, man. Yeah. And the other thing is, is like, <clears throat> you know, in the, being in the U S we have, uh, a lot more resources and a lot more just p personnel dude you know in uh, these in 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 malaysia singapore you know that whole region you know they you know like the hornet squadron as a day they had eight airplanes period yeah. <laughs> right so everything is much smaller so I, it's so hard for me yes uh incompetent things happen there just like they do in the states but uh, I just, it, to me, it's just, a uh, something planned, uh, very well planned and coordinated in my mind had to happen. And I, I don't know if like a rogue triple seven captain could just pull this off, but I could be wrong. I dude, I, I could be yeah. completely wrong, but who knows? Well, I mean, we're going to find out. I I'm, I'm a firm believer. We? we will find it's out. It's like the yeah. Amelia Earhart thing. Eventually. Yeah, you're Eventually. right. Eventually. Well, we have, dude, we have uh, we have Twitter now, so we're gonna find out. It's called X. Gonky. What? Sorry, it's called X. Sorry. Uh, all right, to the chat. Uh, Vulcan says, "Hey, mover, <laughs> our power <laughs> utility company is looking for helicopter pilots to fly linemen and do line inspections. Would you be interested? Is it in St. Tammany Parish in part time? That would be the question, because I don't need a job. Like I'm not." We're, we're talking military jobs mostly. Um, there are a couple civilian jobs, but we're mostly talking military jobs when we're talking about this stuff. And even military jobs, we're we're not. <laughs> we're just, I, yeah. Elias says, long story short, I'm in Pensacola thanks to you two and Mace and company. Thanks, Duderino. <laughs> Solid content advice. Hey, Hell awesome, yeah. man. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Congratulations. Uh, and he might means for flight training, I'm assuming, not just yeah. on vacation. Yeah. Hey, it's a great place to live. <laughs> it is a vacation. Yeah, he's he's outside your window, Gonky. Uh, <laughs> Auburn alum says, that's why he's... Auburn alum says, uh, my son is an aspiring aviator. His desire is to be a pilot that supports those on the ground and save lives. What ranch is focused on this for best for their mission? Marines. Navy, Marines, Coast Guard. <laughs> I, I'm going to throw down and say all of them except the Coast Guard. Yeah, um, because uh, every uh, it, 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 standard but, answer it depends. It depends on the conflict, but well, go ahead. dude, he says save lives, right? And let's be honest, man, the coasties are saving lives, wartime, peacetime. You're you're right. I, I skipped over the uh, the saves lives part. So you're right. It for saving lives, I would be an Air Force PJ, like uh, fly the. Oh the pararescue helicopters out of Patrick Patrick mm -hmm. <clears throat> or yeah. Tucson. I do know this, uh, man, Coast Guard aviation. is yeah. a good deal. Um, yeah. Like there's like, there's some really, uh, it's been a while. Cause my, um, my cousin was looking into it and they have some really good, like from college to flight school, pay for college, make money. They have some really good lead in programs to mm -hmm. their, to aviation. I mean, it's worth looking into the coast guard. Uh, they go to the same, you know, have gold wings, just like, you know, Naval aviators and, uh, you know, Marine aviators, they go to the same training that, you know, the Navy guys and Marine guys do. So they get, you know, they get the military training. Um, but their organization in, in general is, uh, you know, they don't, they're, they are mainly rescue and, uh, yeah. It's, it's, that's probably where I would go. I, I, I think you can't go wrong. You, any of these, like Air Force, Navy, like there's no right answer because in, in some way 
Yeah. Every piece of aviation is a support asset to something on the ground. Yeah. hundred like percent. You're not, you're not the like even the not a pound for air to ground folks. They're Zamboni yeah. drivers. Once the picture's clear, the real players get to work. Everybody yeah. is a support <laughs> asset for somebody else. And that somebody else is the 18 year old with a rifle eventually that has to hold the ground because yeah. otherwise, you know, might as well just throw some tomahawks and stuff. And yeah, the day. you got to I mean, if you're in a real conflict, you got to own the real estate. Yeah. Uh, janitor is back, says the shuttle display in California is now full stack with boosters and external tank. Also saw the shuttle land in White Sands in 1982. Nice. MJ uh, A says, do we really want the proliferation of the F-35? The world already has an obesity problem. <laughs> Cluterus. I love it. Uh, what's the bigger conspiracy, 9-11 or the moon landing? I think as far as believable conspiracies, you know, I think they're both dumb as far as conspiracy theories go. But don't ask uh, who was it that punched the dude in the face? Uh, Buzz that. Aldrin. Buzz, don't don't tell Buzz Aldrin the. <laughs> well, okay. So if you're talking conspiracies, what's a simpler conspiracy? It's the moon landing, right? Because that's that's more closed and contained and easier to. It, it's a smaller group to fake. The nine eleven thing, dude. You had thousands of people that witnessed it either on live television, on the ground, in New York, were there when the second plane hit. Same thing with the Pentagon. I mean, I know people that were in the Pentagon when this happened. So, now, the conspiracies, the sub-conspiracies, if you will, of like, well, hey, we knew they were there, we knew they were going to do it, we let it happen, or, or whatever. Yeah, okay, there could be conspiracies there. But just to say the whole thing was fake or didn't happen or no airliners were used and stuff like that. I think that's a, it's a lot of people versus NASA where it's just a small group of people, <clears> you know, but I think both of them are stupid. So, yeah, I think we really, I, we went to the moon in the sixties for hundred percent. Yeah. Um, 100%. Uh, Kyle says, say it. I'm happy, healthy and not suicidal. That's it. Yonky, you're probably the one that needs to say that. Go ahead and say that, Yonky, for the record. <laughs> yeah. I am happy, healthy, and definitely not suicidal. Yeah. I love my life. Uh, moving on, <laughs> not to be suicided by the Chinese. Uh, so check this out, dude. In the history of... This is not it, by the way. I looked at that and I'm like, oh my God, that looks exactly like it. That is not... I don't think the Chinese would put ED on the side of their... They're a bomber, <laughs> but the China's H-20, here you go. There's a mock-up of it. Uh, stealth bomber could pr prove to be a real threat. So basically they're saying if it wasn't bad enough, they're continuing to make strides with their fifth gen Chengdu J-20. Uh, and then they obviously use that against the intimidation exercises against Taiwan because that's their big thing. But there is a concept of how the H-20 is expected to look. So this is all pretty much media speculation. But it hints that it could be um, very similar to the B-2. And, and where they saw it was that what appeared to be a silvery metallic wind tunnel test model that bears a close resemblance to the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit, uh, which also kind of looks like the B-21. Given China's penchant for copycatting or outright stealing U.S. military technology, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility, according to this article. Uh, Alex Hollings from Sandbox News points out that it does indeed literally and figuratively get off the ground, that it'll turn, uh, in turn, will entail the first publicly disclosed non American stealth bomber ever to fly, could usher in a new era of strategic air power. And then they try to, uh, the Chinese daily declared that the Air Force does need an intercontinental strategic bomber capable of penetrating an enemy's air defense, that the new design would be required to carry 10 tons of bombs, 4,970 miles. And I didn't do the math, but what do you think is 4,970 miles away from China? <laughs> Just yeah. saying. Yeah. Um, not kilometers, so, miles. No, my I I wait. I didn't read the the, the commie units. Uh, 
<laughs> the institute set many national records, including uh, so the ZAC, uh, Jan Aircraft Industrial Corporation, named for its host city, is widely understood to be the prime contractor. And um, they've done the KJ2000 and the JH7. And this says it creates urgency for the B-21. And right now, the B-21 seems to be within budget. So it's a lot of media speculation right now. And I wanted to talk about just kind of the implications of them having a stealth bomber. But if they're just doing wind tunnel testing, they're, they're still trying to figure things out, right? They've a got a little way. model. They know what the B-2 looks like. They kind of know what the B-21 looks like because we've, I mean, it, they've been flying around publicly. And so they're doing their own testing to see kind of how it works and what the best design is going to be and, and how they move forward. Does that mean it's far off? I don't know because they may or are probably not as constricted with the, the, the contracting woes that we are. They probably don't have that problem when everything's state run. Uh, and they have a very robust espionage program where they can cut corners and kind of borrow some stuff here and there. But the tactical or strategic implications of them having a stealth bomber it's, I mean, it's significant if they do, if they do end up producing this thing and it can go, you know, almost 5,000 miles, you know, does it change postures? Does it change kind of, kind of what we're worried about? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I really don't see, you know, I, I really would don't see, you know, China trying to like attack mainland and us, but dude, if it has 5,000 mile range, it could certainly reach out and slow down any kind of task force that's coming to defend say taiwan right uh or something like that so you're right it it gives it basically you know gives them a long arm reach right but i think this thing is years out if it ever actually comes to you know fruition at all could yeah. be wrong but i mean and i mean they have a habit of kind of you know not kind of, but copy and stuff. So, uh, I don't know, man. We'll see. I <clears throat> it might even look like a B two or B twenty one, but it may not have, you know, and it probably won't have nearly the capability. So, just some back of the napkin math here. That range would get you to Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, so it's like the missile warnings unrefueled right that's a one-way trip that's a one-way trip to hawaii um where that's a bigger concern is you don't need to go four thousand miles for the taiwan strait right that's 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 the current hot spot that's the current where we're worried about stuff we're worried about the pacific you're right they're, we're not worried about la right. maybe hawaii but um now with hypersonic missile technology you know does that give them kind of a longer stick to do that yeah but i agree with you i think it's it's a the fact that we don't even have because even i mean look how long some of these other aircraft have taken once they've even had a model right. like work up we're just talking wind tunnel testing at this point yeah <clears throat> exactly and you know the jury's still out on is their fifth gen stuff really yeah, right any i mean i i don't know <laughs> right gen a <laughs> I, I, yeah yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah good point gonky yeah uh all right and uh let's see from the audience real quick well before we go uh ray new member hey welcome Delta air air combo lines uh medtech says thank you uh patek worked on apollo guidance we went to the moon yep i yes i think we most yeah. definitely went to the moon we landed <laughs> on the moon <laughs> When? Dumb and dumber. Uh, Aaron says, <laughs> can I copy your homework? He must have been to Navy flight school. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Gonky, this one's yes. going to make you sad. Oh, gosh, dude. This is uh, about <clears throat> the uh, the Super Hornet and how long it's... Uh, yeah. This article, Doug? where you're... Whoever wrote it. I don't, know. I don't remember the guy. Logan Williams. Yeah, yeah. At, yeah at Logan. Warrior. He's... Jury's out on if he's if I like him or not. Anyways, so the plan is <laughs> the plan is uh <laughs> that last gonna... well hold on. 
<laughs> read, read, read the read the last sentence of that first paragraph, please. <laughs> oh, this, this is why the jury's still out, man. On no, this dude, this dude's got it. He's he's right. First of all, this man speaks my language. Go ahead, read it. I can't read. I'm going to summarize. Uh, you read. Well, it. all right. It says <laughs> uh, the F-18 EF Super Hornet has been a mainstay of the naval aviation fleet for several decades has it been several decades yeah know, geez, we're yeah, old gosh, it is the u.s military's carrier carrier enabled fourth generation fighter jack think the u.s navy's version of the ubiquitous f-16 fighter jet platform and i, I love that this is how we relate airplanes to people yeah, because obviously the world's greatest fighter is what everybody knows and who cares about the super hard <laughs> thing. I mean, and again, in the second paragraph, it says the F-18E comma slash F is receiving an, a new array of upgrades, much as the F-16 did. Yeah. Go on, Gonky. This is your article. Like, I, like I said, this guy, I think he watches a lot of Discovery Wings. Anyways, right, uh, it, yeah. anyways, so this Doug Masters wrote this. Go the, on. Uh, you know, the, the meat and potatoes of the article is, I think is, is valid and true, you know, extending the super hornet's life into 2040 or even beyond, um, uh, extending the flight hour, the, the airframe's ability to go from 6,000 to 10,000 hours is huge. And of course that'll be assisted by things like, you know, the drones or the drone tankers and stuff. So if you can take away some of the missions it's doing now, and then they're going to give it more capability. So there's a whole laundry list of stuff, like all kinds of nerd stuff, right? Faster uh, computers, um, even uh, uh, Earth's capability, more fuel. Uh, Sounds very similar to what the Rafale is getting. Yeah, exactly. So we kind of talked about this. It's the, I don't, I don't know. Like with fourth gen fighters, it's almost like, you know, the, I, do you, do you, the evolution of a, a solid design or do you scrap it and start over with fifth gen? I don't know. Right. So, and it, it's still debatable. What classifies the jet as fifth gen? You know, I mean, what's the, you know, stealth? Well, the, the super horn is stealthy <clears throat> uh, against the mech radar. Uh, it's not as stealthy, but so what's the metric, right? So I think it's. Uh, Can a Tomcat beat it with Tom Cruise flying it? Dude, with Maverick, dude, he beats everything. I think that's what determines whether it's against fifth gen because he goes against fifth gen. Like, yeah, he probably because he didn't know the NATO uh, <laughs> calls. Yeah, he didn't. He couldn't. He couldn't remember. It's a felon. No, it's a. Anyways, Fallon? um, no, I'm at Fallon. No, I'm not at Fallon. I'm not even at Top Gun right now. Yeah. So you know, given the Super Hornet the ability to handle, you know, handle drones, right? The loyal wingman kind of stuff, and and just to keep it. You touched on it a little bit earlier, man. The whole idea of each of these fighters being in a coordinated data link, right? So, you know, it's all about networking and informa information sharing on the battlefield for tactical decision makings or for tactical decision making so you can win, right? So that you, you want, you know, you, you would want the, you know, the probably arguably the backbone of your fleet, the Super Hornet, at least for now and in, into the future to be a part of that. So, they're just keeping the airplane modern and the picture they showed at the beginning that that's when I worked at Boeing, that was referred to as the international roadmap Hornet. And, uh, it's a pretty awesome machine. I think, you know, some of the block three stuff has been incorporated into, you know, this 2040 plan, which is starting to roll out now. Um, you know, the only thing, <clears throat> the, the, the only thing, all these toys and stuff are great, but as a, as a fighter, I'm a big fan. It needs, it needs more thrust. Cause like you mentioned, we were like, as the airplanes, like this stuff isn't weightless. <laughs> right. Well, right? sometimes so, it does reduce weight, right? Like a, an ESA radar from a Mac, you can lose some weight there. And yeah, on, on the wiring, you know, sometimes when you go to the ethernet versus the old, that's no true. Standard buses, you lose some of that wiring weight. That's true, but inevitably, yeah, uh, if, airplanes if get heavier. If you're like this guy saying that this thing's your home router uh, and you're a <laughs> Wi-Fi node, I'm sure that's adding some weight. However, comma, you know this. I think this turns into the the standard. What's the next conflict going to look like? And it's it's digital and it's information. 
And having this being the network node, you're getting the loyal wingman, you're getting all the intelligence, you're getting battlefield awareness. Now, at what point is too much information? Do you have too much information and it just bogs you down because you can't process it all? Yeah. And then I, you know, then there's, you know, there's the argument from knuckle draggers like me that that technology is that's all that's so all these, uh, the network, the data, all that stuff, it's all defeatable. I mean, it's that's that's my beef with it. You know, you can you can yeah. spend a lot of money and training on developing an entire battle plan based off, you know, uh, information being fed to you. But if that's cut off and it doesn't even have to be cut off completely, if it's partial bits. Right. I mean, like, um, you know, at the end of the day, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's as we found out in Vietnam and I know that was a long time ago, but, uh, you know, BVR was the plan with the F4 and that didn't pan out. And even in, you know, Gulf war 91, you know, a lot of that stuff was, if it wasn't like pure BFM, it was definitely inside of ranges that, I mean, like, you know, that we would, de we would want to be at, uh, in, in modern fighters today. You know, I mean, I, I just, when you weigh the rules of engagement with, uh, you know, jamming EA technology, all that stuff, man, I just, I, I, I just see some of the uh, technology piece falling out. And then that's when it's important to have, you know, the Super Hornet has a lot of capability, but if you can't get that airplane up high enough, fast enough, sometimes, uh, you know, shot ranges and stuff like that are going to suffer, right? You want a high performance airplane is what I'm saying. And it is a high performance airplane, no doubt about it. But if you start adding a bunch of weight to it, uh, I think, I think a little more power would be, yeah, okay. that's just my own opinion because I like power too. I like lots of thrust. Oh, oh yeah, huh? oh, I mean, you oh, can oh, never oh, have too much thrust. Oh, yeah, more power. <laughs> uh, John says maybe soon since the Chinese are making a concerted effort to uh, hire U.S. military personnel. He's talking about the H twenty. Sorry. Uh, will there be an Ultra Hornet? I think it's a Mega Hornet at this point. Like the next one's got to be the Mega. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I mean. You know, this Hornet, the 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 Block 3, and I don't know if they're going to do a Block 4 or whatever, but it's an amazing airplane. I mean, move. remember when we were flying against, uh, well, gosh, it's been almost 10 years ago, right? Over 204. But, man, the the Navy, the, the latest and greatest Hornets we flew against when we were Red Air and F-18As, those things were pretty, <laughs> yeah. they are pretty good, you know? Yeah. Uh, Zippers Forever says, wait, I learned the TACP trade on the A7, A6, A4, and OV-10 was around for the first plastic bug, a.k.a. the F-18A, the article makes me sound <laughs> old. If it's all about the network, the future of Navy fighters is the E-2 with Wombat. <sighs> Riley says, F-18 this, F-16 that. We all know the F-15 is the greatest jet platform ever. Before I answer, is your name... <laughs> Po boy or <laughs> yeah <laughs> who am i talking to right now we all know the eagle's a big grape it's cool uh <laughs> you got a thousand clps for your gun cool um Thank clean you. lubricate protect what is a clp I don't, All right. yeah, I don't know i don't know uh gonky let's get serious for a minute it's time to talk about the mental health minute Today we're going to talk. So this was from John. Actually, he he talked about uh, accountability in a different sense, but we figured we kind of adapt it to us because we don't want to get like somebody to come after us. But accountability is important, and we do this every day as as fighter pilots in any high performing industry. You have to be able to take accountability for your own actions. And as fighter pilots, we say in the debrief, you know, sometimes there's no rank. And you want to be upfront and honest and own your mistakes. You know, I did this. Uh, in fact, and sometimes in the Navy, Gonky, we, in, in some debriefs I've seen where they don't say I, they say their own call sign, right? That's a Top Gun thing where it's, it, it takes away the personal nature of it. And it's River 1-1 did this, not Mover or not Gonky. But you're still taking accountability for it. And the important thing is, in anything when something goes wrong 
it's best to stop digging. And I have seen this in law enforcement. I've seen this in the military. I've seen this in my current job. And I've, 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 been a, I've done it myself. When you get into a situation that sometimes isn't going your way, a lot of times we kind of want to get into defensive mode. And by doing that, we, when we try to turn everything outward, we make things worse. Versus if we make a mistake and we realize that, we say, yep, I screwed up. Here's what I did. And how do we fix it? Nine times out of 10, when you raise your hand and say that people will want to help you and they'll try to do their best to keep it from getting worse. It's when you don't own up to it, especially in in an industry like flying a fighter or aviation, you'll lose a lot of trust when you can't take that accountability. So we talk about this in the sense of mental health because I think that when you when you don't take that accountability, you're kind of lying to yourself. You're kind of lying to yourself about what's going on, and you may end up spiraling and spiraling into a situation that is much, much worse than if you just said, yep, I did this, and please help me fix this, versus you either run away from it or you you, you push back and never try to own it. And it just gets worse and worse and worse until eventually you're in a situation where your mental health is so bad you can't take it. And you either turn to uh, drugs, depression, or alcohol, or you end up making a permanent decision for a temporary problem. And this is my you know weekly talk about you know if that is the case, it's always better to reach out to a wingman, reach out to a friend. 988 is a good uh, hotline. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, taking some permanent action, uh, military one source, a lot of wings have a uh, director of, of psychological health that you can go to. There are, you can go to your chaplain, you can go to your leadership, you can call 911. If, if no one else will listen, it's better to take that accountability for the things that are going wrong and ask for help than it is to try to fight it alone. And then nothing ever goes, it just gets worse. So, Gonky, what do you got? Yeah, as usual, you hit all the highlights. I'll just add, um, you know, it's uh, obviously in the flying world, uh, you're, whether you like it or not, you're held accountable because, you know, if you don't fess up, uh, it it will reveal itself. I would say, man, to add to what you said is, you know, the struggle is being accountable when nobody's looking, right? And sometimes that's, that's when it counts, right? So, you know, if you're struggling with something or if you're trying to do something, you know, you, you know, you're your own worst enemy sometimes. And like you said, if you don't hold yourself accountable and you don't face reality and, you know, when, when that happens, uh, perception begins not to be reality and that can be a bad thing. Uh, because, you know, the, the, you know, a lot of times that, you know, in the, you have more experience than I, than I do in this, but when I've seen, you know, mental health go sideways, a lot of times you just step back and you're like, this person, uh, what they're thinking and believing really isn't true right now. There's a lot of people that actually do care. You know, there's yeah. actually a lot of people that, that, uh, you know, that want to help kind of thing. Right. So holding yourself accountable when nobody's looking, I think is, is a challenge. And there's, there's all kinds of ways you can do that. And I, you know, one, one thing that I, I, I read it <clears throat> in a self-help book somewhere, but, uh, you know, I, I try to, I try to be, uh, I, I try to take accountability for everything that happens to me. Right. Uh, and how I react to that. And I think what that has allowed me to do is, um, you know, get in front of problems. And a lot of times, you know, like you talked about, you know, running away from stuff. So a lot of times that's not the right thing to do. And I'm not here to say that I get in front of problems and, you know, divide and conquer. That's not usually what happens, but it's just the, just the exercise and the, uh, just the, the acknowledgement of, Hey, the, you know, the, uh, somebody needs to be accountable and it might as well be me. And a lot of times this stuff is, uh, with, with family stuff and whatnot, but yeah, man, uh, being accountable and to yourself when nobody's looking, I think is probably about the only thing I can add to what you said. You pretty much covered it, Doug. 
Um, I was was getting something ready, and then you did it right at the end there. Uh, it's a great <laughs> it's a great part of relationships. I mean, if if you're in a relationship with somebody and you did something, and like Mover said, everybody's getting defensive, just saying, "Hey, that was me, my bad." What do we do to, to move on? Um, that and it's really important in high performance situations like flying and racing. You better be accountable because the next time you do it, it's liable to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. So like in a debrief, right? You tell a young wingman, speak when spoken to. But not just not just that, because you should be absorbing, you should be learning. But also, I think that when you're in a situation like that, and it's a high performance, high stress environment, the worst thing you can do is try to explain yourself away because nine times out of 10, the instructor on the other side knows they've been there. They've seen that they know, they know the common errors. You're not the first person to make this mistake. And when you start trying to explain it away, it takes away from the learning versus, yep, I'm sorry. You know, I screwed that up and not even, I'm sorry, just acknowledging the fact that you did it and then accepting how to fix it. Because I think we internalize criticism a lot because uh, we've talked about this, you know, with the haters and stuff like that. But when it's actual valid criticism, the the idea is not to attack you as a person. It's to fix something to make you better. And as soon as you realize that, that the whole point of any of that is to make you better, then you 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 look for it. You seek it out. You start going, hey, what can I do here? What can I do there? It teaches you to be humble as well. You know, yeah. I mean, if you... I, maybe maturity is not the right word, but if you have the maturity enough to be able to, you know, uh, accept, <clears throat> you know, the responsibility or, you know, take on the accountability of what has happened. Right. So. Yeah. And on a less serious, but still serious note, I, I forgot to, uh, you and I talked about this this weekend, Gonky. I made fun of you using the wrong word and I'm sorry. Which time? On, on the last Which time? Minute. So I, I called, so we had this Marine in my squadron when I was in pilot training that would call everybody a mongoloid. And for whatever <laughs> reason, I was searching for the word to call you for somebody who doesn't use technology. Well, apparently that's a Luddite, right, Doug? That's, that's the word I'm looking for. That's definitely a Luddite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mongoloid is like. Lud Luddite is definitely better than the other word. <laughs> yeah. So mm. I, I said that I shouldn't have said it. I, I didn't. I have a knuckle dragger. Know, <laughs> right, but that's mongoloids more like a it's not the right word. So I apologize uh cuz I know, you know, I mean I don't obviously don't ever want to make fun of real people with special needs, but I've got my brother's got special needs, so it's it's definitely something I'm sensitive to, but um uh, I meant to call you a luddite and See, he bully he bullies me in real life. Uh, well, sometimes it just <laughs> you start rambling. Now this was on the mental health minute a while back and nobody said anything. Like nobody called me out for it. So I apologize because I didn't realize it until I was watching. I'm like, does that sound right? And then I Googled it. I'm like, oh, no, no, that doesn't. That's not the word. <laughs> that is not what I was looking for. So uh, anyway, back to the serious part. Some people from the chat have actually said some some things. Uh, Midnightly says people who take accountability seriously, not only elevate themselves with their honesty and open disclosure or discourse, Discor disclosure, they raise everyone around them and people want to work with them. Be that person. Yeah, you don't want to be with the other one, the opposite of that. Kyle says, starting with no excuse, allowed us to then break down the tabletop and learn 31 years with Dallas Fire, 100%. And yeah. that works in law enforcement. Yeah. Any any high stress, high performance job. Yeah. I mean, you can't trust somebody if if right. If they're not willing to own it. You know, if, yeah. if if there's always an excuse and there's always a but I was thinking or but this happened, it's like, no, man, just yeah, hundred percent of the time, the guys I like. If you ever flew with anybody that just nothing was ever their fault, you know, I, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, man, <laughs> you're gonna have to be on your toes. Yeah. Uh, John says by placing a mirror to your actions, help with trust and confidence from colleagues and those you may lead. Be honest to yourself first, and it's okay to say it's completely my fault. Right. And, and that doesn't mean you have to go to the extreme. Right. And and oh, it's my fault. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's my fault. I'm so sorry. It's it's there's a there's a balance. There's the accountability for things you realize that need to be fixed. And, you know, sometimes you're not wrong. You know, sometimes you you did do the right thing 
And you do need to speak up and say, hey, this is what actually happened. Or this was my perception of it. You know, I always had a flight lead that said, hey, ask the cool questions. Don't don't make statements, you know, just like, hey, but is this right? And oh, yeah, oh, <laughs> my bad. You're right. Because sometimes that's true, too. Right, Gonky? I mean, yeah. you yeah. know, we're not infallible on either side of the table. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I make I make all the mistakes. <laughs> Kyle says, uh, may I show forward operators group, a 501c3 discord, mostly dedicated to unaliving prevention. Hell yeah. How do you do? Do you just look up forward operators group? Yeah. That do that. Is. Yeah. hundred um, percent. MJA <laughs> says super important. If you don't own your mistakes, you won't learn and you won't move on. Owning up doesn't equal punishing yourself. It means acknowledging dumping the baggage that other would otherwise accrue learning and moving on with a stronger compass. Yeah. Yeah. And that is it for the relevant comments. Uh, I think any reattacks on the mental health part? I almost shot off one of my fingers one time. If I didn't take accountability, I would have a lot less fingers. (laughs) Yes, I know the finger goose. Don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, don't do that. It was 100% my mistake. Uh, Hey, man, you owned it good. um, uh, Back to the CLP. Uh, Seba gave you CLP 1,000. Hi, sir. If I send DCS, can you play it? I don't have DCS. I have to go borrow. He's going to send it to you. Or she. she, Seba is going to send it to you. Okay. (laughs) I'm I'm Ron Burgundy. You can play it on your MacBook, dude. I think she was talking about a... uh, I can't even talk about it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Building a mission, right? No, he said, "Can if I send DCS, can you play? He wants... Seba wants to send you DCS and then have okay. you play it, but DCS is free to play. Yeah, so. I'll have to play it somewhere other than my residence because my wife is not a fan. Mover can play because he had doesn't have such restrictions as Gonky. So, king in the castle, king in the castle. I, I'm, I'm a limited airframe over here. <laughs> yeah. so. Gonky is not in command of his own ship. I'm not full up anymore. Hey, hey, that's a good segue, dude. Hey, speaking of DCS, I think that's the one we're on this week. Oh, me and the F-14? Yeah. Yeah. So that thing was after fun. I think after so so we kind of did it out of order, right? The last one was the F-86. Then we got into the P-51. You guys already saw that. That was what we let off with because we thought it was going to be popular. It was not. Uh, <laughs> none of these DCS videos have been all that popular. <laughs> Nobody wants to watch a couple has been I, I don't blame out them. on a video game. I don't blame them. Uh, these are much shorter because we only did like one set each yeah uh and that's this one so we've got i think what we have left is the tomcat versus the f5 then the tomcat versus the su-27 and then uh, hornet yeah we may have done a mig-29 but the i th- i think and those were all one-offs we just did one each those are going to be super short videos for the next couple of weeks but then at the end i think the more interesting one is we did the um uh, it was a Tomcat or is a is a P fifty one versus the was it the one oh nine? Is that what oh, I was? Oh yeah, no, it was the one oh nine. Yeah, that yeah. was yes, it was. That thing has yeah. the leading edge slide. That's crazy. Yeah, that thing was awesome, dude. Yeah, it was. And that Turn, will end it. So we'll end it on out. the on the one oh nine. And then you have to go back and we'll do five more hours of BFM. They well, allegedly. No, we're not doing five hours for the love of God. Um <laughs> Allegedly, they've changed the flight model of the Hornet to the give Hornet, more yeah. alpha. More alpha? More alpha. You could always use more, more thrust and more alpha, man. You just can't. Slow speed performance has been improved. And it doesn't rate around as well. So it's more like a Hornet. Uh, <clears throat> I will give my opinion and then promptly get squashed by the on online uh you will be told how wrong you are but you will take accountability for it such i will 100 percent. these are my words and i speak them with confidence (laughs) whether they're right or wrong tbd (laughs) yeah so um we'll go uh because i gotta do the viper because the viper's got a new flight model too so we'll do another viper versus hornet just to try that out and then we'll do viper versus gonky gets to do the weirdo things the Big 21 and the Tomcat and yeah. all that stuff. So, yeah. Hey, and if you're in Pensacola, definitely swing by Wings, check out 
which mm-hmm. which is it's like a museum slash DCS. It's awesome, and he's all he's got stories for days. Yep, that's where I go. That's where I go. They have my virtual jet. Virtual they jet. Keep, they keep it shiny. <laughs> Jenner's back says, "Is the DCS F fourteen with inverted communication?" You know the finger. <laughs> you had the hands, right? Didn't you have the jazz uh, hands? I did, yeah, but I need to keep both hands on the flying devices because I I'm not real good in DCS. I'm not sure if you've seen. Oh, I've seen. Hmm. Uh, all right, Gonky. We somehow managed to make this two hours and twenty six minutes with no wombat. <laughs> Dude, do not. He may accept that challenge. You may have. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm kidding. Mad. I love Wombat. Yeah. Wombat is an awesome American. That's it, man. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's, uh, yeah, we made another one. Episode 36 is in the books. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for the comments. Like, hey, this one wasn't as good as usual. Did you see that one? The, the people are like, uh, you did not your best work, guys. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? I take full accountability for that. Uh, we, no. Mover and I, Mover and I, have been working literally. I would needed. say our best work is behind us. Jake says, "Here's ten bucks, Gonky." Oh, uh, thanks, Jake. Yeah, yeah, I would say we worked all weekend, man, doing real work. Yeah, I mean, plus the beard's gone. It's gonna take me a whole month to get it back to where it was last time. Yeah. And but then I'm have to. Yeah. Uh, actually, I might have a two month beard because I'm, I'm um. Are you driving race Daytona? Cars? Yeah, so I'll Sorry. be driving race cars. Uh, I'm gonna have to disapprove that. I'm gonna have the <laughs> Duck Dynasty beard by the end of the. It's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna borrow right. your office, Douglas. Anything? Thanks as always. I have nothing further. All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody. everybody. Appreciate it. See ya.